All right, I have some new tour dates to let you know about. I'll be in Norfolk, VA, Virginia on November 9. I'll be Roanoke, VA, November 10. Huntington, West Virginia, November 11th. Over there at the Mountain Health Arena, formerly known as the Big Sandy. I'll be in Evansville, Indiana on November 1-5 at the Ford Center. And Winston-Salem, North Carolina, November 17th, as well as New Orleans, Louisiana, on November 24th at the UNO Lakefront Arena. All tickets are available at theovon.com slash T-O-U-R. Um, we have been moving into some bigger venues. Really grateful for it. Um, and we'll do a mix of bigger and smaller ones at the time. And um, just because we don't want to be on tour forever. You know, we want to be on tour for a while. We just don't want to be on, you know, until we're deceased or whatever. So thank you guys for your support. Theovon.com slash T-O-U-R. And if tickets are too high priced, just wait. We'll come back through sometime. Gang. Dr. John Verveke is a professor of psychology at the University of Toronto. He currently teaches courses on thinking and reasoning uh, with a focus on cognitive development, intelligence, mindfulness, and the psychology of wisdom. He is a smarter guy. He's an information man, you know. Um, He's also an expert in Buddhist psychology. He has a 50-part lecture series on YouTube called Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. I've personally been thinking a lot about meaning and what it, what just meaning of life, meaning of self, um, things like that. You know, uh, we had a call about it on uh, the last solo episode and, and, uh, and that's one of the things that, uh, Dr. Verveke is, is, um, is highly informed about. So we're going to spend some time today with him and, uh, delve into that and some other things. I'm very grateful, uh, that he's here today. Today's guest is Dr. John Verveke. Uh, John Verveke, thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's a great pleasure, Theo. Yeah, great it's pleasure. really exciting, man. I, um, a lot of my friends have been uh, turned on to you and just like your ability to like share your thoughts like in a concise and, and informative enough way where I guess people are able to absorb them and they don't sound too monotonous where it sounds too much like you're studying kind of. Yeah. You know? Well, I mean, I, I really... Uh, well, I'm... I really believe in, I don't just believe, I really believe in the work I'm doing. It's, it's like it's a calling for me. Um, and so, um, and it's something that I live. And I, I, part of, I mean, I've been a teacher for a very long time. And I think part of being a good teacher is to always be yourself learning. And so I try to teach by sharing the enthusiasm of the learning I'm going through. Like even when I'm doing a lecture, I'll learn something will come up mm-hmm. and that moment will jazz me. And that's, that, that's the style I've tried to develop. And it seems to work uh, at least for the material I've been privileged to get to teach. Yeah. 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 And you teach all, I guess, I mean, a lot of people like, I guess that a lot of things that I get shared for about yours are like about meaning and looking into meaning. Yes. And especially at a time where it feels like people are, or for me, even if, I mean, it feels like we're getting into this cul-de-sac in America where it's like, is there a lot of value to my life? Do I, am I just a cog in the wheel? Am I just a consumer? Is there any, you know, what is the purpose for me? I think a lot of people are starting to ask themselves that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I call that the meaning crisis. And I think there's good evidence that it's becoming very prevalent in the West, whatever that means these days but you know sort of north america europe you know yeah uh uh, japan hawaii yeah australia yeah things like that um and the symptoms are you can sort of see symptoms of it um all through the culture and um and i've also seen a significant increase 
um, in, in, in the work I'm doing, both academically and in the public sphere, uh, especially since COVID. COVID really ramped a lot of these issues up for people in a powerful way. What the what the issues of like questioning themselves? What's yes. going on? Yeah. So the thing the thing one of the interesting things that uh, COVID did is it threw people back onto their inner life. Mm. Um, and, and what's interesting is our, our culture, especially North American culture, um, right? And this, I'm not the first to observe it. You know, it has a high preponderance of a tendency towards narcissism, being very like you know. Uh, so people have oriented their lives in a very self-centered way, but and but they thought that, right, or they can maybe, a better way of putting it, they confuse that with having deep, rich inner resources. And when everything sort of stopped and they couldn't focus the world on them and they had to focus on themselves mm. in order to find resources, and what you found was a bifurcation, like a division. Uh, some people were like, whoa, that, like, that really threw them. Um, uh, so I, I, I'll, I'll, say, I'll say something to you, and I, I'm of two, of two minds of it because I'm happy about it as a scientist because I made a prediction, mm -hmm. and I'm sad about it as a human being because <laughs> it's not a good prediction. <laughs> um, so just as the pandemic was hitting, I said, what you're going to get is you're going to get a rise in a term that Julian Evans uh, made famous called conspirituality, this mixture of conspiracy theories and spirituality, and that took off. And then I said, as we come out of the pandemic, we'll get a mental health spike. Mm. And then a little bit later, sort of an increase in crime. And all of these things are coming to pass because what had happened is many people are thrown into the interior life only to realize for all of the self-centeredness, they've actually not given any wise attention to their inner life. Mm -hmm. And they were suddenly without resources. Other people saw this as a, an opportunity and they framed it that way. And so what's been springing up where all of these online communities where people, not to sound too highfalutin or anything, but people started to say, I know I, I really want to cultivate wisdom. I mean, there's tons of information. There's a lot of bullshit mixed up with it. There's, you know, and there's all this stuff and then there's science and that, but I want wisdom. And so, and I get, in, I've gotten involved with quite a few of these communities. So that was, that was, there's, there's both, you have both negative and positive symptoms in the culture uh, like, you know, um, the number of close friends people have is reliably declining, even for all of our social net, mm. internet connections. Uh, loneliness is becoming epidemic and loneliness is like, it's very unhealthy. We are, we are, we are naturally social cultural beings and right. lo loneliness is. Well, it's becoming a hobby too, for some people in a way it's becoming almost uh, so common that it's like, um, or not common, but it's, well, I guess common, I guess. And once you start to become something, you, there's a part of you that will want to find the most organized way to be it and to engage in it. Yes. So even in loneliness, it's almost becoming a culture, you know? It is, but it's a culture with great cost. Uh, I mean, we, we have weird things happening, like the UK has set up a ministry of loneliness, which sounds like something out of Orwell, right? Like the ministry of loneliness. Yeah. And, and it's like, whoa, how did we get there? Yeah, it sounds like an Ozzy Osbourne album. <laughs> oh, yeah. <that's> Maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I wonder how he would say that. <laughs> Mr. <Mr. Lonely. laughs> Sharon. Yeah, I don't know. He might. He probably would get one of his kids. To say, I don't even know if he can talk anymore. But um, but yeah. Well, so so to go back, so you're looking at. So when you look at like, so COVID, you're saying had a, a, a was an opportunity or caused a lot of us to like interflect. Or yes. Like look inside of ourselves. Yes. Yes. Okay. And some people did it like in a healthy way. Yes. Where they kind of looked inside of themselves and were like, "Wow, I haven't looked in here in a while. I'm going to find ways to challenge myself and see what's going on here. Yeah. I'm going to join other groups and uh, people that are curious about um, their inner self. Yes. And then other pe and then what the other group? What happened? Well, I mean, th they a lot of them sort of fell into the things that were already at work in the culture. The meaning crisis predates COVID by like centuries. Um, but, um, uh, you know, you saw a rise in mental health issues. Uh, so depression and anxiety have gone up and they have continued to increase. Um, and this is quite independent of how affluent. Uh, so Silicon Valley has a tremendous problem 
with depression and anxiety. Here are the people who are supposed to be at the pinnacle of our society. You right. know, we sp- we idolize them, right? And yet their 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 kids are in trouble, and they're in trouble in, in certain ways. Have we always throughout time have people always searched for meaning in their life? Yes. Has it always been yeah. like um? Are, are we at like a because we were like you're saying that COVID kind of put us in this place where it kind of put us in a fast forward of people willing to start to look at that because yes. the the fabric of society kind of stopped yes, and yes. paused. And so you're left with yourself, really. Yeah. Um, but people have always looked for meaning. That's exactly right. I mean, so in, in the series I did and in the book on, on zombies, uh, the, book is in a, uh, the book is the idea that zombies are a myth that arose to try and give like give people an image of the meaninglessness in their lives. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, But uh, we talked about two kinds of issues. One are what we call like perennial problems. Like you said, there's issues that human beings always have confronted and we can get into why that might be the case. Um, And then there's also historical factors that are now have been growing since the late middle ages and accelerating and things have, you know, there's been a lot of major things uh, that are accelerants on those historical forces. And what happens is the ho- historical forces sort of undermine the, uh, the like you said, the cultural fra- fabric that normally helps people to address the perennial problems. And then what happens is you get a vicious cycle. The perennial problems get worse. The social fabric tears more. The perennial problems get, and you start to spiral. Mm. And that's where it feels like kind of like we're at. Yes, yes, that's, that's and, and, and that's, that's amazing. So, when when I I didn't I didn't like I, how the, the awakening from the meaning crisis came up was well, actually a, a former student of mine took a class with me and said you should turn this into a YouTube series. And the awakening for the meaning crisis is your YouTube series, right? Yeah, I have two major YouTube series. I have awakening from the meaning crisis, which is about what we're talking about, mm-hmm. and then there's after Socrates, which is an attempt to do uh, an in depth. Um, reconstruction, um, reverse engineering of a Socratic way of life um, as a way of cultivating wisdom both individually and collectively. What does that mean, a Socratic way of life? We're not going to know what that means. Right. So the unexamined life is worth living. So this is a Socratic quote. He says this on at, at his trial, mm-hmm. uh, and, and they basically say to him, uh, stop doing philosophy, we'll let you go, and he said, or, or if not, we'll kill you. Right. Oh wow! And he says, uh, "Well, the unexamined life is not worth living. I'd, mm. ra- I'd rather die." And so, Socrates, Socrates is very, very interesting. Um, he has he has two sort of influences. One influence he's influenced by the f- sort of the first scientists that are emerging in ancient Greece. He takes a look at the natural science, and it's a it's a breakthrough. Like as opposed to a mythological way of thinking, these early thinkers are using observation and reason to try and understand the world. He thinks that's powerful, but he finds that the science, and this is relevant for us, right? he he finds that the scientific information isn't existentially relevant. It doesn't lead to personal transformation. It doesn't tell them how to become a better person. So it gives him a lot of information and it makes him understand things, but it's not helping him as a person, as a as in his soul. And, and you see, and that's what how a lot of people feel about our scientific worldview. We have a scientific worldview that explains everything except how we generate science and how we have live live how we should live meaningful lives within that worldview. So Socrates says that's not good enough. The truth seeking is good, but it's it, it's not giving me any relevance. And then there's the sophists, and that that, that literally means sort of the wise guys. Mm-hmm. And these are the people that invent rhetoric. You know, the first sort of. Um, First good use of bullshit in, 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 in a technical sense, in Harry Frankfurt's sense. You know, the liar tries to manipulate you because you care about the truth and they try to convince you that something is truth. But the bullshit artist does something different. They try to get you unconcerned about whether or not something is the truth and just caught up in how catchy it is. Mm. Advertising, all advertising works this way. You, you know, you watch, you, you, you watch the alcohol commercial, right? Here's a bar and somebody gets a drink and there's gorgeous people and happy music and everybody's well-dressed and smiling. Go into a bar, right? Yeah. That's not, that's not, and we all know it's no, false. it's right? not the same in there. No, but it's catchy. It, it triggers all kind, you know, sexuality and vibrancy and sociality. Yeah, possibility. Right? Yeah, and all that. And it's, it's, so it gets very catchy. And you don't care about the truth, and you get caught up in how catchy it is. And this is, and this is what the sophists discovered. They, had a, they, knew, they, they learned how to make things catchy. Mm. So they would really go deep into people and change them. Now, they did it in a manipulative fashion. Now, Socrates said, well, they're the opposite. 
they're, they're giving me lots of relevance, transformative power, but no truth. And he, what he did is basically said, I want the two together. I want transformative truths. I want to, I want to go on a quest to find those truths that catch. Wow, he was like a gangster, huh? Yeah, he was. Well, I mean, he's, he a was hero. Like a, he's a hero to me. Yeah, well, it sounds like that's what I'm saying. He, it sounds like he was like a John Wayne of like, let's do, we're going to do this a new way, and this is the way that it needs to be. It just sounds like he was a real pioneer, kind of. He is. I mean, it's called the Socratic Revolution. I mean, he's an astonishing individual. Uh, like, he, he was extremely brave. He had a reputation, like, he, he was a soldier. Um, and at, at several times in battle, he showed tremendous courage and presence of mind when everybody else is panicking. Wow. He could, he could stand in one s place, like in, like in profound meditation for like 24, 48 hours. Uh, he, uh, he was, he was, his life was threatened several times and he never sort of capitulated to, uh, to the forces. Um, he was brave. He's brave. Um, he, he, I mean, he is creative. It sounds like, yeah. And he's, tr and he, he invented this way of interacting with people. Um, he would ask them questions and he would try, try and draw out, um, like what he, he compared himself to a midwife. I help, I help people to give birth to themselves. Wow. And so he, he wasn't, he wasn't like, he would often show people that they're, their claims to being wise or to knowledge didn't work. He would get them into this. St it, they, people said it was like being stung by, uh, like, uh, by, by a stingray or a spell cast on you. You'd get into this state. And he did this for a particular reason. So the, the Athenians had oracles, like the oracle at Delphi. Have you ever been to Delphi? I know. Uh, I don't think so I have. Is it? Um, nope. I haven't. It puts the zap on you, man. It, really? It, it, yeah, yeah. Like it, like you stand in front of the Omphalos, the navel of the world, and, and this, this chasm drops away in, fr and then this, in front of you and this mountain goes up. And, you know, and this woman, she would sit in a cave and there's some th speculation that she was getting intoxicated and then she would, she would speak answer people's questions. Now, when you're an oracle, right, if you want to stay in business as an oracle, you don't give really clear answers to people, like, right? Right, because you need them to come back. You need them to come back. So, you know, you know, uh, should I marry Cassandra? Well, sometimes the squirrels don't gather nuts. Yeah. Mm, okay. What, what is, yeah. So, what, <laughs> there was, so a friend of Socrates went to the oracle, and I, I, I always, I have no basis for saying that, but I always picture them sort of like, sort of smirking and you know, nudging each other. We're going to ask this really cool question, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you and ready? So, and so she goes up, and they go up, and they, and they, and they, and they, they say to her, "Is, is there anyone wiser than Socrates?" And they're expecting this really cryptic, and, and she said, "No, no human being is wiser than Socrates." Straight answer. Wow. So the, she went back. They, so he went back, and they, they tell Socrates, "No." You and I, we're honest. If they said, if we got that message from the gods, we go, yeah, yeah, I always knew it, right? I always knew it. He does, he does this other thing, and this tells you how Socratic he is. He says, well, the gods can't lie. That's, but by the way, that's one way, and he's revolutionary. The gods aren't like the ancient gods, just superheroes. The gods are like moral exemplars for Socrates, so they can't lie. But he also says, but I know I'm not wise. Mm. How can those both be true? What? And he turns it into this quest. So he goes and he keeps asking people, right? So somebody claims to know something, or they they know what a particular virtue is. They know what courage is, and he'll ask like two generals, and they'll and they'll and he'll he'll constantly question them. And and it's and he's trying to draw it out, and he's trying to find out. And what typically happens is, the the this what's called a dialogue, Plato wrote. It ends with no clear answer, no clear definition. And, but Socrates isn't a skeptic. So the the, the um, so so he so he doesn't get a clear answer. But he, that's okay. The goal is is the goal to get a clear answer, or just to create conversation. Uh, 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 beyond that, see the, the goal is to get people to take up his quest. Ah, uh. see. So if you look at so he's talking to these two generals, and the two generals about courage. One of them does the I just know. He just speaks from his intuition, and Socrates destroys that with throws him with the contradictions, the problem. The the other quotes, so the per first person speaks from like a first person perspective, well, I just know, and Socrates destroys that. And the other person peaks, you know, speaks from this third person, well, here's a technical definition I got from the sophists and blah, 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 yeah, blah. Yeah, nerd. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, and Socrates destroys that. And then it, there's, and Socrates can't offer a definition. And you think, what was this all for? 
But you have to, see, in a dialogue, you have to pay attention to the drama, not just the argument. Because what the two generals say is, we want our sons to come and spend time with you and live with you, Socrates, because our sons are going to get courage from you. Mm. Socrates can't explain, he can't define courage. courage. Courage, if you think you can put courage into a definition, you don't get it. Right? You have to get into this, not the first person this, or the third person, the second person, you, us together. Right? You catch it, but, it has, but it's, a, it's a caught truth. Remember we were talking about it? Mm -hmm. And what happens is Socrates exemplifies ah. what it is, and he, he, he lives it in conversation with people so that they start to catch that orientation and catch his quest. Wow. And was that a new thing at the time, to have that sort of energy, to have that like – for people to really start to question things like that? So as far as we can tell, and that's why it's called the Socratic Revolution, and there doesn't seem to be any of the ancient sources that contradict this. Socrates, in, uh, Socrates invents, discovers. We don't have to – there's a Latin word that's much better, inventio. It means to discover or, or invent, mm. right? He, he inventios, right, this way of helping people to give birth to themselves. Wow. So, So – the people I work with, we've cre we've tried to reverse engineer this practice. We call it dialectic into dialogos, and we have workshops that sort of get people to take this up. And and so, what we do is we'll have them do these practices around a virtue like courage, or honesty, authenticity. And it's and we and and what happens is they they and we tell them this, but they also realize it, right? It's, you're not the point isn't to be right about this. The point is to come into right relationship with the virtue. And that's what happens when they do these practices. People come out and go, I'm kind of experiencing something like awe and a, a love. for." I, I thought I always knew what honesty was, like the technical definition right. or the intuition, like the two generals. But, but now I, I don't, but I, I like, I'm like Socrates. So you get this right orientation. And now we go back to Socrates because he finally resolved that paradox that he had from the gods. He realized that he was wise in that he knew when he did not know something. Mm. But not in the shallow sense that I, you know, I don't know about Albanian tin production or something like that. Right. But in this sense we're talking about, which is like, I really don't know what honesty is. I have a, I have a love for it and I'm oriented. I want to be in the right relationship. I want to open myself up. I want to learn more about it. Mm. Football is back in full swing with another week of epic games. And who's got you covered on the action? Every single one of them. DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. New customers can bet $5 on football and get $200 instantly in bonus bets. Nobody's missing out on the action this season. All DraftKings customers can take advantage of two new offers every game day this September. Get in on the NFL Week 2 action with DraftKings Sportsbook. Download the app now and use code THEO to sign up. New customers can bet just $5 and take home $200 instantly in bonus bets. Only on DraftKings Sportsbook with code THEO. The crown is yours. You got to keep that hair, baby. You got to maintain that fleece. That's important. That's right. And keeps can help you do it. You shouldn't do it alone. No. Keeps is an online subscription service that makes it easy and more, to, more affordable for men to treat their male pattern baldness from the comfort of their home. Mm -hmm. With Keeps, you can get clinically proven treatments to address hair loss and boost hair regrowth delivered right to your door in discreet packaging. Hmm, what's he getting? I don't know. Keeps offers both of the FDA-approved hair loss treatment options, as well as a two-in-one gel that combines both treatments. Hair loss stops with Keeps. For a special offer to get started, go to K-E-E-P-S dot com slash Theo or click in the link in the description. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash T-H-E-O. When it comes to like searching for like meaning, right, like as a person, you know, mm -hmm. do we do it, is it something that we do as individuals, like are we, do, do, is there any value in finding meaning as an individual? It feels like to me sometimes more like the value is finding 
meaning as like a species or like a group, right? Like, mm-hmm. I guess when I think about meaning, I don't think like, what is my what is the meaning for me? What is the purpose of my life? Mm-hmm. I, I find my brain often thinks more like, what is our purpose, right? Mm-hmm. What is our meaning? Mm-hmm. Um, th- so the, the individual pull is you need to cultivate wisdom. wisdom. But what's the collective pull? And you put your finger on it. So what is this meaning thing? So a lot if you do research on it, there's four dimensions to it. Uh, and the one that people think it, it, it's synonymous with is having a purpose. That's only one of the dimensions. It's actually not the most important one. Of the dimensions of meaning. Of yeah, meaning, meaning in life. So right. we're not talking about like the meaning of a sentence. We're talking about what makes your life worth living even though it has all the frustrations and failures and faults and flaws in it. Right, because I think especially you get to like a middle of your life kind of or ballpark, you know, and you start that really starts to hit home. You're like, oh, well, my youth is disappearing. Yeah. What is the what is my purpose here? And then is it the purpose of just me or am I part of a group and we have a purpose? Those are the questions. Yeah, that I really kind of right. see us getting hit with a lot. So purpose is important, but there's other factors. Uh, one was it was in the literature was called coherence. But some of the original experiments have failed to replicate. And so it's a broader notion. It's more like your world has to make sense to you. It, it can't be absurd, right? Because if the world becomes absurd, then then you start to really feel that reality is meaningless. Well, that's starting. That's another thing that's starting to happen. I mean, we can go into that. Yeah, we um, can. We can. And that's very different. People can, people can act on purpose uh, even within an absurd world. Well, a lot of my meaning I've noticed, like, recently, like, it seemed like um, – Recently, it seemed a lot like uh, the the texture or the fabric of society is kind of eroding in America, right? Like a yeah. lot of traditions are being yeah, yeah. said that they're no good. We're like um, trying to renegotiate our past to make it look a certain way. Um, Everything's in question. Yeah, a lot of things are in question. A lot of tradi- people are saying that even like the Pledge of Allegiance for just things that ha- gave us all commonality seem to be um, disappearing, right? Yes. And so I realized that that started to hurt me because I was like, man, a lot of my meaning as yes. a person, yes. I had attached to excellent a lot of these commonalities. And I didn't realize that until yes. they started to go away. I'm like, well, if this stuff doesn't mean anything, like then do I mean anything? Okay, so notice that, notice that. So there's two, that's the two missing dimensions. One is people, right? And One is they, they, they're, they're, their reality can't be flat. It has to have a depth. They have, to, they have to be able to point to something to say, this is really real, right? If, you, like, if everything feels sort of illusory, then you're also in a kind of a nightmare situation, right? But the one you just pointed to, this is the crucial one, and this is the one, and I'm going to pun a little bit here. This is the one that matters. It's called mattering. This is the one that matters the most. And mattering is this. You, uh, uh, there's a really good book by Susan Wolf called Meaning in Life and Why It Matters. Um, and, and you know, when you, what the metaphor people use is, I want to feel connected to something larger than myself, something bigger than myself. And here's a way of seeing if you have this in your life and why it might have come into question like you were just talking about. Ask yourself, what do you want to exist even if you don't? And how much of a difference do you make to it now? Okay, so take me through an example of that. So let me think, what do I want to exist? Even if you don't. Even if I don't exist? Yeah. Um, probably families. Yeah, so these are people. You want them to exist even if you don't? Yeah. Yeah. Like and happy children. Yes. Happy families maybe would be something I would say. And do you think you make much of a difference to them right now? Not a ton. Right. So you need a good answer for both of those to have a strong sense of meaning in life. Okay. So get, take me through an example of somebody that would have a good answer. Like what, what would be an answer that would probably leave somebody feeling fulfilled after they ask themselves those questions? Well, I want to I point to something that you put your finger on. Uh, there's a decline in the bigger picture, worldview. Um, and it off, the worldviews that we we experience them, and I'm trying to use this term very broadly, religiously. So I don't mean just like Christianity mm-hmm. or Judea, Judaism or something like that, but I also mean what used to be called American civil religion. Like the, you have their heroes and things are sacred like the flag and you pre- pledge allegiance, which is a kind of prayer, right? Uh, and so – and both of those religious frameworks, and even though they're tearing each other apart about it right now, they're falling. 
right? And so people used to say they would die for their country. Mm -hmm. People did it in World War II. They, right, they want the U.S., the United States, to continue existing. They think the universe is a better place if the U.S. is in it, and they are making a difference. They're in, like, they're in Germany, and they're liberating the world from tyranny. And so they're making a real difference right, to this overarching worldview, American democracy, Americanism. Mm -hmm. They had... Meaning in life. So much meaning in life that, like Socrates, they're willing to die for it. I mean, they must have. I mean, to think like, yes, I'm an, I mean, they had people that were ch lying to get into yes. the draft. Yes. Like, I want to go serve my country. I will die for my country. They believe that much in it. It feels like we're further from that now, for sure. So that, the idea of your country being that thing is probably less. Right. So that's the other poll now. Remember, we talked about the individual poll. Then there's the worldview, the the right, the the poll that we we no one you didn't invent English, did mm -hmm. I? Right. It's these are the things we invent together, and we evolve together, and we participate in together. And one is like there was a great metaphor by a, a, an academic called Peter Berger. He called it the sacred canopy, where you had mm. this worldview that basically gave you, uh, it told you how to be an agent in the world and it it made the world a meaningful arena so there was an agent arena relationship and they were attuned to each other so you knew what to do you knew how to fit in and and so you had this world view that grounded things and this is the bigger picture and then people could could connect their personal wisdom cultivation to this bigger thing and enhance their meaning in life and this mm. is what religions both civil and you know, uh, religious. Sorry, we don't have. We, we need another sacred, I suppose. Civil and sacred religions. They were both doing for people, and these have been breaking down. Right. For a whole. So those are the historical factors. And when they break down, people's ability to find purpose and depth and clarity and mattering gets undermined, and their self deception exacerbates okay. because, because they get isolated like we were talking about in COVID. They get disconnected from a shared worldview that gives them these, – these ecologies of practices, you can't do them on your own, right? You'll, you'll fall prey to sort of – you know, if you're just an autodidact, like a self-learner, you'll fall mm -hmm. prey to all your biases and all your egocentrisms and your unrealized comfort zones. You need other people to so, be – So we need each other to have meaning. You, yeah, we transcend each other through each other. Like right. I try, like so this is Socrates. You know how I can most transcend myself and overcome my bias and my narrow frame is you challenging you. Me. We, yeah, you, we are the keys to each other's locks. Yes, yes, yes. And so what happened is, right? You need that worldview to home those ecologies of practice. Right. Give them legitimacy. Give them tradition. Right. Which is not the same thing as nostalgia. And then what we've done is we've undermined that worldview. Mm -hmm. We've We've torn apart the ecologies of practices because, and people are, are like they've largely abandoned the legacy religions. They're now abandoning, abandoning, abandoning the civil religions. Even the, 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 the very weak religion of popular culture is breaking down. Oh, there's more Fortnite players than there are Protestants probably. Right, right. Yes. You but, know? But, but look, at how, look at how those – like a, a symptom of the meaning crisis is an attempt to create worldviews that have a, a myth – when I say mythological, I don't mean that negatively. Mm -hmm. I don't mean like a lie. I mean myth, myths aren't ancient stories about the past. They're 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 they're, they're stories about perennial problems and patterns. Right. And so, like, think about the whole MC universe, and we call it a universe. We're trying to create this entire worldview in which basically we have Bronze Age gods who, nevertheless, are Socratic heroes and pursue virtue, and they they fly around and do all this stuff, and it's falling apart. We can't even keep that running. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like this is how bad things are, and so the perennial problems. Start. They start to get worse. They tear out what's left of the worldview. Mm -hmm. The worldview can't home the ecology. People get more foolish, more self, and the whole thing just spirals. And so, 
if that was that a good answer by the way to the two polls yeah i think it was really good man yeah i think it was really good i'm you know i'm doing i'm doing a decent job i think of keeping up good um i'm trying to make it uh, accessible for listeners at the same time i think you're doing a great job at that thank you oh thanks man yeah i appreciate it um so what happens historically in a time where we get to a place like this is there pat has this happened before in yes. time yes okay so we don't need to be alarmed at the point like humans have never been through this that's right. We have been through it before. Uh, now, there's a like there, there's two there's two uh, stances on this that are both sort of wrong because they're extreme. One is, oh, this is human beings have always said the meanings and problem, and, and it's a dismissive thing. And then the other one is, no, this is completely absolutely unique. And there's truth to both. What's unique is we face a set of problems that are global in a way that was never global problems that were this like this, you know, complex and and growing. Like we face an interconnection of the advent of, you know, AGI. We already we're already facing, you know, growing the growing impact of social media. You know, people are looking at issues around the environment, uh, energy. As you said, ec our, our political economic system is breaking down. It's gridlocking, and people are losing faith in it. And I use that word deliberately mm -hmm. in in a, in in a deep way. And so those are, those are I think unique things we're facing. And they, I, I think, uh, when we're in a meaning crisis, it sort of hamstrings us. It really weakens our ability to turn our best wisdom towards these problems, because when we're in a meaning crisis, right? So, oh, especially now if we're all isolated and we're, we're not isolated even, and, and, and it's we're, not we're our best. It's very self motivated. It's not our like group conscience. Um, we're, we're acting out of fear, a lot of people. Yeah. And we're acting out of like, and, and our ability to cut through the bullshit and to realize when we're in self-deception is, you know, being seriously challenged. Oh yeah. So our ability to handle this is, is very weak, but it is also the case that there have been other points in time in which there have been not, not globally, but, um, like in the ancient West, uh, the Hellenistic period, there was a, a a meaning crisis at that time too. What was that about? Uh, so it's basic. So there's Alexander the Great. Mm -hmm. like, so Socrates was he great or not? Well, it depends. <laughs> so, um, because that's a straight. I mean, that's like you're not even leaving any. You know, you're saying, hey. So he he changes the course of the history of Western civilization in a profound way. And if that's what you mean by great, just sort of changing the course of things, he's okay. great. Okay. I'll give it to him then. Well, but but, but I, I also want to say, like, so my partner, like, she's Persian, and the, Alexander Great is the bad guy in the Persian world, right? Oh, so depends <laughs> on who you ask, huh? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So he's like, uh, right. But w what he does is, like, he, he conquers most of, you know, like, the Silk Road uh, and, you know, uh, uh, the, the, some of the major civilizations in Asia, Europe, and Africa. And then he dies at a young age. Um, and so his empire breaks up into his, his – first of all, there's a period of fighting mm -hmm. and, 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 the, and, the, and, the, and the generals carve up his empire and then there, there's just ongoing warfare. Now, I just want to compare two people, somebody living at the time just before Alexander, the time of Aristotle, who taught Alexander, by the way, mm. right? This is their life. They live in a, a like a, a polis, a city. They've lived there, and their ancestors have lived there for all their life. Everybody around them speaks the same language. And everybody mm -hmm. practices the same religion. If you're in Athens, you participate. Well, if you're a male, so it's a, right. You participate directly in the government, mm -hmm. right? You know, you you know, but in person, the leaders. So, right, this is like after Alexander, you're now in a world in which the people, you might have been uprooted, people have been uprooted, moved so it's around. It's a little more global than at that w point, kind of. Yeah, exactly, but that's exactly the parallel. Right. right. So people around you speak a different language, they haven't been there for years, you might not have, your ancestors might not have been there, they have different religions. Right, different you've conquered, there's an area that's been conquered, so now there's more of you to con consider whenever you're making laws and rules. And, and these kingdoms are constantly shifting, so you may go to sleep in the Ptolemaic Empire and wake up in the Seleucid Empire and you don't know. Oh, and that's yeah. the thing, the government is thousands Thousands of kilometers away from you, so people felt um, there's a term for this. It's called domicide, which is the killing of home. 
they felt they didn't mm. feel at home in the world anymore. So this has been called an age of anxiety. And now what happened at that time, and in some ways, this is the project I'm trying to do now. What happened at the time is philosophy changed in order to address in order to address this meaning crisis. So before, it, it, with Socrates and Plato, you already have these questions about meaning and wisdom. But what gets added to this existential ethical dimension is what you might call a therapeutic dimension. Epicurus, who's one of the prototypical philosophers from this time, said, call no man a philosopher who has not alleviated the suffering of others. The mm. philosopher became the physician of the soul. And what happened is philosophy took on this dimension of how to alleviate anxiety, how to increase people's sense of meaning and connectedness. And we got Epicureanism and Stoicism, and then eventually we got Neoplatonism that drew them all together. And we got, and you've, you also had the, the emergence of new religions that were trying to, right? There was syncretic religions in which people were merging gods. Like, or, or mother goddesses, because when you don't have a home, a mother goddess becomes a really big thing. Isis becomes a big deal. And of course, Christianity emerges in this mix too. Wow. So that's interesting because it's kind of where we are. I see that where we've been now for a little bit, like people are uh, gathering around speakers yeah. or men and women who are able to share a message yeah. of hope or give them um make them feel like they have meaning or purpose yes, yeah. why people listen to uh, or start have started to listen to people like um i mean jordan peterson's an easy one because he's been very popular yeah. guys like you who are able to co converse uh or just sh you're able to put into words what a lot of people can't that's one of the problems that a lot of us have we can't put certain things into words so we start to especially in times like this you start to look to somebody who seems to have it together I think. Yeah. Um, does that make any sense or it, no? It, it does, and it, it lands uh, It lands very well, but it lands with a sort of a, 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 a very strong sense of responsibility. Um, That's so. true. Maybe it's putting too much responsibility on those people. I guess I'm not looking at it from that perspective. I'm looking at it more from like the people in the – in the polis in the city or whatever who were <laughs> no. like what do we do now and and you know and like um like as other things start to fall as the fabric of our society the traditions and stuff start to like get more opaque or whatever does opaque does that mean opaque like vague like yeah or you vague, can't see or him yeah, as well yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what do we do you know and so you go to somebody who i think sounds like they know what they're doing right so it's again there's there there's a risk there right like there's a, a tremendous risk of and there's risk both ways there's a risk of the person the figure uh being wrong well being wrong or or not caring if they're wrong there's mm. a lot of bullshit right and um and, and then and then there's also risk for the person they might be sincere but uh, you know, for every myth we have in the Greek tradition of the hero, we have an equal myth of hubris. Hubris is when you try to be the gods mm -hmm. and the god, like Icarus, you try to fly to the sun and the, the right, you try to or Phaeton, you try to steer the chariot of the sun and you right, and Zeus has to kill you, right? All that right, humility basically, right, right, and Socratic humility, right? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, one way of understanding the human task is to keep a keep a, hit, a hold on both the fact that we're finite, we're prone to error, self-deception, and, and, and unforeseen fate. But we're not just animals, we're also called to virtue. We have a capacity to transcend, and we have to hold the finitude and the transcendence together. If we just do the transcendence, we, we can fall prey to thinking we're gods, and then mm -hmm. the, the hubris falls, and that's what a lot of these thought leaders do. And then on the other hand, but if we don't give people something, they can just they can just collapse into their finitude, and and then they're 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 subject to tyranny and servitude and despair. Mm. And Plato is all about trying. And he uses Socrates to represent somebody who Socrates described himself as metaxu between. He was always holding those two together. And so I try my I try to take on the responsibility you've put your finger on in. And I try to live it that way. Um, and, and so, I mean, one of the things people say to me, um, and it, it's really a profound compliment for me, They'll, a lot of people say, John, 
you gave me the vocabulary, like you were talking about a few mm. minutes ago, to talk about this, to think about it, to talk to other people about it. Um, but I have to balance that off with a tendency to get too self-absorbed yeah, in, my, well, in my own terminology. And right? that's the fallacy. It's one of the, I get. I don't know if the fallacy is a word, but not wiener. I'm talking about the other thing, the... Which one? The like a like a confusion fallacy. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, that's one of the fallacies of just being human. It's like you can, if you if when things start to go well, this happened to me before in my life. I started to get some popularity and yeah. things seemed like they were going good. And I start there was a moment where I was like, well, I started asking myself, does God have some special plan for me? You know, yeah, yeah. which is a dangerous thing to start asking yourself. Yeah. It's it's okay to ask to be curious and see if you know what the how i can be of service yeah. but part of that gets real tricky yes. because then you start thinking you have some special power and that's where it can just get scary and i think there's it's just being human it's part of the it's you know yeah. it's that's what that fulcrum is right there is just trying to keep that even you know and theo i think about this daily i think about this daily i i, I have a i have an amazing team of people around me I have a non-for-profit organization, the Vervecki Foundation, that keeps the money and the power at an arm's length for me. I'm not, I'm, I'm not in charge of it. Uh, I, um, I have a bunch of people around me who have been given ongoing, non-negotiable permission to tell me if I'm starting to believe my own bullshit. <laughs> okay. uh, um, hey, and, you don't strike me as that person at all. Well, um, I wasn't trying to say that. No, 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 no. I'm uh, just trying to examine this. It's really interesting. I examine it for myself sometimes because I have people that like will say, hey, man, you really helped me with this or you've helped me like- And that's good. Think about those things. Right, it makes me feel like I'm being of service, right? Yeah. But then it's I have to be careful like that I don't let that leave the room with me yeah. in a- in. It's like beautiful music, right? Yeah. You, 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 you joy in it while it's happening because somebody is sharing with you. Right. Right. right? And, and you don't want to, you don't want to rain on somebody when they're sharing with you because they need that. But then, but it's like music when the song's done, the song's done. Don't keep hymning right, right. Don't keep, yourself yeah. as you leave, right? Yeah, exactly. Don't put your AirPods <laughs> in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, la, la, la. John is great. Right. John is great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Today's episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. Indeed, BetterHelp, they can help. They'll do it. They helped me. I tried them out. I needed help. I called them. And I've gotten help. That's it. You can do it over your phone. It's easiest, discreet. You can do it on FaceTime. Especially if you live in an area or in a place where you're just, you don't, you, you know, if you go see the therapist, they're going to tell everybody. They, you're going to, they going to, every time you go down to uh, the 7-Eleven or to Casey's, they're going to know when you walk in, oh, that's him. He needs help. You can prevent all that. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. There's no shame in that game, baby. Take care of your brain and your heart. Get a break from your thoughts with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash T-H-E-O today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp.com slash Theo. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. I want to let you know that Morgan and Morgan has teamed up with Richard Childress Racing to support Kyle Busch and Austin Dillon and are offering one lucky this past weekend listener the opportunity to attend race day in Las Vegas on October 1-5. That's right. They are giving one lucky winner $2,000 and two tickets to see Kyle Busch race live in Las Vegas this October. Entering to win is easy. Just go to morganvegas.com slash this past weekend. That's morganvegas.com slash this past weekend. No purchase necessary. Open to legal residents of the 48 contiguous United States and D.C. who are 18 and over. Sweepstakes ends 10-1-2023. For entry and official rules, visit morganvegas.sweep.com. P.com. Also, if you're ever injured, you can check out Morgan & Morgan. Their fee is free unless they win. 
For more information, go to forthepeople.com slash this past weekend or dial pound law, pound 529 from your cell phone. That's F-O-R, the people, dot com slash this past weekend or pound law from your cell. This is a paid advertisement, and we are grateful to Morgan and Morgan. It's the calm right now before the holiday storm, and I hate to say it that the holidays are coming, but you can hear them. You can hear them. Holidays are coming. They're humming around the bend. You know that, but you can prepare your e-commerce business for the holiday rush now just by using ShipStation. Oh, God, it sounds good. Whether you're shipping from your house or a warehouse, ShipStation can help increase your profitability. Save time automating your shipping and returns in the ShipStation dashboard and keep costs down with industry-leading carrier discounts while your holiday orders roll in. So set your business up for success this holiday season with ShipStation. Simply go to ShipStation.com and use code THEO today and sign up for your free 60-day trial. That's two months. That's ShipStation.com, code THEO. So one thing that I think about when I think about meaning is like, if you look at like some past cultures, they had... um They would give their, when people were dying, they would give them like weapons to go in the afterlife with, like medallions, maybe a couple, you know, chocolates or freaking, I don't know if they had butterscotches or whatever back then, but a couple little candies for the road, you know, they would put that in their bear, in their casket, right? Yeah. So imagine what life was like when you thought that death, like there was a whole nut, like you, this was just a preparation. Yes, yes. That must have added so much. I feel like that would have added so much meaning. It can to being alive, whereas now that doesn't seem. Yeah, it's not as prevalent. I mean, nobody. I don't, you know, I was at a place one time. Somebody maybe put a couple quaaludes or something in a dude's pocket in a <laughs> casket, but I've never been there where they're you know armoring them up and putting them in like you know um, Under Armour or anything. You know, so uh, I, that's a really important thing. Uh, there's a really great book. Uh, I'm teaching an online course for the Halkian Com- uh, Academy on Beyond Nihilism, and we started it with uh, Tillich's book, The Courage to Be, which is a really great book. The Courage to Be by Tillich, you said? Paul Tillich, yeah. Okay. And he talks about the, these diff- the, these things that can really take people into despair. Um, and he, he talks about them analytically, but he's very aware that they can interpenetrate, and you can have multiple ones at the same time. <clears throat> and one is the one you just mentioned. Um it's mortality, um, <clears throat> but you have to you have to broaden it. You have to understand mortality. Think, but we have the we talk about a fatality, mm-hmm. but that the base of that is not death. The base word in there is fate. This is the idea. Your death is just an example of how the universe is perpetually, profoundly beyond your control. You can have met the woman of your life and you both know it and you're going to have, and you step into traffic and the truck hits you oh. and it, right. And it's not the case like in a romantic comedy yeah. that the great narrative that is unfolding. Like meet pr- Joe Black. That's what happened. I think in that. Yes. So we, 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 we confront, we confront fatality, which it ultimately in our mortality, um, that's one. One is one we've been talking about, meaninglessness. The world can just suddenly seem flat and futile and we can feel alienated and anxious. And then the other one is guilt. Uh, Not just in the everyday sense of like, oh, you know, I I shouldn't have said that to Peter. It's in a more profound sense of, I think I'm just a bad person, Mm. right? I I like... I, and not necessarily evil. I just you the weight of your flaws and your failings and your faults can be magnified, especially if you if you're very honest. I mean, Theo, I don't want to live forever because I don't want to try and carry that boulder that will get larger and larger of my flaws and my fates mm. and my finitude, right? And that can weigh you down. And so I think. I think one of the things that, I think you're right, one of the things that most people have lost, although not as many as you might think, so although uh, participation in the legacy religions, the world religions, is declining, 
uh, even in America now. America was always the weird exception, but now it's starting to decline. So in a couple generations, most people in America won't be religious adherents. Wow. That's scary feeling. Well, that's domicide, so welcome to it. Sorry. That's uh, domicide? The loss of home. Loss of home. Oh, the loss of feeling at home. Loss of, loss of feeling at home in the universe, right? We used to call it a cosmos. Cosmos was like cosmetic, be beautiful, mm -hmm. and now we call it universe, right? It's flat. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't, there's no depth to it. So those, all three of those intersect. Now, one of the things, and I want to go back to, remember I mentioned like the Hellenistic philosophers like Epicurus, mm -hmm. even Socrates, they tried to address the problem of mortality. Socrates said all of philosophy is a preparation for death, right? Um, and they tried to address it in a different way. And, 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 can I try to just just to give people, sure. first, first of all, one thing, other mm -hmm. cultures, so I have a lot, I've been practicing within Taoism and Buddhist practices also for three decades, so... Uh, see, so if you look in, even in Vedanta, if you look in within Hinduism, at least important, I mean, I don't want to talk about them as they're homogeneous, but at least large swaths of Hinduism, Buddhism, right? Immortality is a curse. Like, Immortality, living forever is a curse. They right. all viewed it like that, you're saying. Yes. Okay. Because, because the idea is reincarnation, you come back again and again and again and again. And like I said, the, like this is kind of like karma, the, 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 the faults and the flaws and the failings pile up uh, right and and it just it, and it becomes oh. it becomes just horrible um and, and what you seek for is moksha you seek for liberation from rebirth or reincarnation or you seek nirvana you're seeking you i don't want to be reborn oh so when there's real in some of those religions where there's reincarnation they seek to be freed from that that is the core of vedanta you want to you want to realize moksha wow. by realizing that the ground of your being your soul and the ground of reality are one, and that liberates you from being attached to, I want this, I want this to survive, I want this to survive, and let uh, go of that. And, and Buddhism has something similar. It tries to convince you that the idea that you have a substantial soul, Atman, is, an ult, is ultimately false. And if you can really truly, not just as an idea, but like we were talking about earlier, if you can let go of it all the way through, then you'll be liberated from that. So it's a different response. Now, the Hellenistic philosophers did something very similar in the West. Epicurus, he was famous for this. He, he didn't try and convince people that they were immortal. He's, he, 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 he tried to get people to change the way they frame their mortality. Mm -hmm. So he famously said, where death is, I am not. Where I am, death is not. What he's what he, what, what, what's he doing there? Is he playing games? What he's saying is, you can't actually experience being dead because if you're dead, you're not there. Mm. There's no experience. And as long as you're experiencing, you're not dead. You can never have the experience of being dead. And so, so what do we no, And People say, that's not good enough. That's not the point. The point is, so he's trying to get you to be more discerning. What right. is it you are afraid of? You're afraid of dying. You're afraid of going through the process of losing your vitality, losing your relationships, losing your body. You're not afraid of death. You're afraid, like you're not afraid of all the time before your birth when you didn't, didn't exist, right? Right. So, right. So what is it you're afraid of dying? You're afraid of losing. Losing. So here's what we could do. Find the things that you can keep up until the very last moment of consciousness. And he said the one thing, the two things that you can always have are wisdom and friendship. Mm. Cultivate wise friendships and friendships that support wisdom. And he was he was suffering horrible illness as he was dying, and he took that right through. And he right, and he and he also taught people how to not fear the gods, right? And 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 so that was one response. The Stoics, you know, Marcus Aurelius. People all know Marcus Aurelius from mm -hmm. the movies, right? And Marcus Aurelius, the, what the Stoics said is, look, the problem we are is what what we set our hearts on, what we what we identify with, mm -hmm. right? Like we're always assuming and ass assigning identities. For example, right now I'm assuming the identity of, of like uh, you know this academic person. I'm assigning an identity to you, but this isn't the identity I would have with my partner when I go home at night. Right. That would be weird, right? And I wouldn't assign the well. 
Sarah, you're going to interview me now, right? Yeah. That, right, that's weird, right? And so we're always assuming and assigning identities, and we're doing this in this interlocking manner, that agent arena way. But here's the thing: most of the time, we do this unconsciously. We do it mindlessly, yeah. automatically, reactively, and so we set our, we identify with the wrong things. And so what the Stoics said is, I'm going to use, I'm going to, I know your viewers can't see, I'm drawing a horizontal line. Mm -hmm. We identify with horizontal things. We identify with trying to extend our life, have more fame, have more power. And they said, that's ultimately doomed. You're pitting yourself against the universe. You're very, the universe is going to crush you. Yeah. Instead, go vertical. Seneca said, even when you're painted into a corner, you can jump into the sky. Mm. So the vertical is, don't try and get the most extension of your life. Try and get the greatest depth. There's a there's a book. Wow, that's so powerful. That's really, really cool. Yeah, and so you live that, and you try and realize that now. They did this in... Uh, Even when you're painting a corner, you can jump into the sky. Yeah. And so things people can do when they feel like they're painted into a corner, they can help somebody else. That will that creates probably some... Uh, and, and they can get more in touch. They can, And this is helping other people. To, service is definitely a way to do this. You, They can get... Think about the think about this as the I mentioned earlier. People don't want a flat world; they want a world with depth and height to it. And you can you can you can touch the depths of reality and the heights of reality. And you know, of course, you can do this with mindfulness practices and other kinds of practices. And you know, I'm just thinking, cause I get a lot of questions. People asking, oh, yeah. like, "Hey, man, I'm in a tough spot right now. I feel like there's no way out. What oh. do I do right now?" So that's why. And a lot of times, I'll say to those people, you know, try and be of service, try and help someone else. It is. Um, get out of yourself. We, you know, we get st we get trapped in in ourselves. Definitely, that's that's very that's very much the case. So that's what I'm thinking. What other uh, things would you recommend? You think? Well, so let, let's talk about this. Let's okay. let's talk about uh, and um, I think this will have personal relevance to you too. And and if uh, I, I don't want to push any buttons inappropriately, uh, but uh, let's talk about when people the one of the worst versions of that, which is addiction. Okay, and so my friend and colleague. Mark Lewis has one of the best theories of addiction. It's basically a reciprocal narrowing theory. So, so your world is like getting really problematic. So you take a substance to alter your state of consciousness so that it doesn't seem to be so threatening, at least for a bit. The problem you pay for that is you weaken your cognitive abilities. Now, when you come, when you when you weaken your cognitive abilities, your ability to solve problems in the world goes down. So now the world's more threatening. Mm. So now you got to take the substance, and now you got to take more of it, and then you weaken your cognitive abilities more. And you see what's happening? The world is getting more and more oppressive, fewer and fewer options, and there's you have less and less cognitive flexibility. You less have less and less ability to move, maneuver in your mind to change until you can't be any different, and the world has no future. And that's addiction. You've wow. reciprocally narrowed your way all the way, yourself all the way down. Now, I was having dinner with Mark, lunch with Mark Lewis. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, and Plato's in the back of my mind because I got this from Plato. I said to Mark, I said, well, if you can reciprocally narrow, can't you reciprocally open? Mm. Can't you bring some flexibility to your mind and that opens up the world. You start to see the world in more depth and then that actually opens you up into the depths of yourself and and the world and you can reciprocally open. It would the, make sense. Yeah, and that's what Plato talked about when he talked about the 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 myth of the cave, you know, and we turned that into the movie The Matrix. Mm -hmm. So, right, you can you can you, you can wake up, you can reciprocally open up. And what's what's important about that is that's jumping into the sky. That's like a set. The word for that is in Greek is anagoge. It means ascent. Like like when the the, the the people are in the cave, right, and they ascend out into the uh, into the real world. And so you can you can open up. Now, what's interesting about that is, like when you do that, this was Plato's great insight. Three things are happening that are really really important. Two. Well, I'm going to use meta again. Two meta desires. Mm -hmm. So in addition to whatever you desire. You desire that what is satisfying your desires, you have peace of mind. You have, you're not at war with yourself. You're not in conflict with yourself. Right? Okay. The other is you desire that what is satisfying your desires is real. You may say, well, that doesn't seem right. Well, let, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me give you just one clear example of this. So we've tried to take everything that used to be carried by God and civic and sacred religion and culture and tradition and heritage and legacy and put it into our romantic relationships. They're going to do all of that for us. This is the weird, messed up 
We're, we're, oh yeah, we we make someone our power, higher power. That's right. Sure. That's right. And we and we say to one person, "You're going to do all that for me," and they can't. And so the relationships break inevitably because our right. expectations were insane. Your relationship shouldn't be your ultimate, right? Your relationship should be nourished by what is ultimate. That's a mm. different thing, right? So you ask people. I do this with my students. I'll say, "How many of you are in deeply satisfying romantic relationships?" That so a certain number put up their hands, and I say. Of the ones that have their hands up right now, keep your hands up if you would want to know if your partner was cheating on you, even if that would destroy the relationship. And almost all of them keep their hands up. And then you ask them, well, why do you keep your hands up? And they said, because it's not real. I want it to be real. I don't want it to be a fake. I don't want it to be fraud. I want it to mm. be real. Now, what's happening with this reciprocal opening, the opposite of the addict, in which everything's becoming unreal, is they're getting more and more integrated as a person. The world is making more sense. It's getting more real. They're getting more at peace, and these open. Those are the two things. You're satisfying those two things in a joint way. And here's the third thing. When you do this with a person or with reality, so mutually accelerating disclosure is the technical term, but... If I open up to you mm -hmm. and then you open up to me and then that enables me to open up more to you and we do this reciprocal opening with each other, that's love. Mm. That's what, and it doesn't, I'm not talking about romantic love. It can be yeah, friendship yeah. Love, love, right? So Just buddies, yeah. reciprocal opening gives you peace of mind, gives you a deep reality and it causes you to love. That's leaping into the sky. Mm. Yeah, you notice I get that a lot when I go. So I'm, I, I go to recovery meetings, and so I'll go to meetings. Yeah. And like one of the things that's nice about it is, I sit in a room a lot of times, and people just share what's going on with them, right? And everybody just listens. You just listen. You don't even. No one replies to that person. No one judges them. Yeah. No one. Yeah. It's just this place where somebody can share, and whatever their feelings were with that, they can just be in the room. And there's no. You start to create this sense of comfort in people that you can share this uh, that the world is a safe place to share which probably was got closed up if they were really you know like narrowing in it and, does. Sharing, and and isolating it's like so this thing starts to grow and it's just like it's almost a comfort it's just a comfort that grows but then it it it, it becomes like a, a positive algae on other things and then everything starts to grow a little bit yeah you know? and it and, really is it's expansive though yeah it is very expansive is what it feels like and and expands out and in is that is that fair to yeah, say? yeah i agree that's really what's interesting about it you're like before you know it you're kind of feeling okay a little and it's a but it grows on itself you know so imagine if you're siddhartha gautama the buddha right or perhaps socrates and that is how you were always living and you you so the 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 prob the answer to the problem of nihilism is not some argument the answer is to fall in love with being with reality again in this way we're talking about and when you do that right you get that vertical dimension well let me tell you a story right so this is uh Julian Barnes wrote a book, uh, History of the World in Ten and a Half Chapters. He's, there's this one story about this guy. He dies, and there's an afterlife. And he goes to heaven. St. Peter's is there. Oh, yeah, well, do whatever you want. And, 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 the, and, and the good place made use of this, but I won't do any spoilers about it. But anyways, um, the great ending. They made use of this. And he, you know, he, he wants to play, and he, gets, and he plays golf, and he gets to the place where he can play golf absolutely the best every single day, all the time. Then tennis, and then other, and he, painting. And then, and then after a while, he comes, and it's like, you know, I'm kind of done. And he's like, and, and St. Peter goes, good, good. He goes, what good? He says, the point of heaven is not for you to live forever. I always think of the line from Moby Dick, what is man that he should want to live out the lifetime of his God, right? Mm. The point of heaven is for you to be ready to die, to ready for to cease to be, because you're immortal. You shouldn't be forever. And then stoicism is, can you live now so vertically that you're ready to die. Not I'm like in some stiff upper lip. We misuse the word stoic. We think it's about being stiff. Stoicism is about joy, mm. not pleasure. It's about joy. It's about this vertical jump. It's about this vertical, like deep depth, right? Can you have such joy in this way we're talking about that you're ready to die? Wow, that's a great question. It's interesting. And then how would people get there, you know? And how does a man, like, you know, how do people get to that place today? The responsibility. I think men are feeling a ton of responsibility yes. right now. Yes, it's very know? hard. 
And that's okay. It's interesting. It's that's what that's what's being brought on by the world and by society. I think men are realizing that they have to be the uh I don't know if it's the ruler of their kingdom, but they have to really start to step up and be a leader in their home and in their environment. I think it's really I mean, for me, somebody that's been of help for me, um, is Marcus Willis. I mean, uh, so he's a great Stoic philosopher, uh, but he was also the um, the the, the Roman, uh, Roman Empire. He runs the whole Roman Empire. He's, he's the last and perhaps the greatest of the five good emperors. And he said something that you have to really let it reverberate inside of you uh, because it really, it, it, he said many things. If you read his, the, medita- yeah. the meditation. He was chatty kind of. Yeah. Thank God. Yes. Well, the meditations aren't written to anybody else. They're actually, if you, the Latin, written to him? Yeah, they're written to himself. Wow. So he's doing a spiritual practice. And this is a practice you can do, by the way. And it, it, it starts to work. Mm-hmm. Uh, but one of the things he wrote to himself, he said, it's possible to be happy even in a palace. Hmm. Right? And that that's so interesting. Because you, you, you think the last sentence is going to be even in a prison or even in a desert island or something, right? Desert island. And it's like, nope, it's possible to be happy even in a palace. And it's like there's a way in which all, the, all those things that are catchy but don't have depth, we can, we can, we can learn and we can help each other. Uh, Thich Nhat Hanh said the next Buddha is actually the Sangha, the community, right? We can we can learn to discern uh, through all of that and and get to that where we can find that vertical um, uh, such that we can leap into the sky. Mm. I love that, man. I love that feeling when you're stuck, you're painted into a corner that you can still leap into the sky. There's a way to find fascinating reciprocal opening. There's a way and, 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 and let's let's be clear. I mean, you have Marcus Aurelius on, on one. I'm not saying Sto- I have criticisms of Stoicism, um, uh, but you know, Marcus Aurelius is an emperor. Ep- Epictetus is a slave. The, the the two poles of, and they're both saying you can do this. You both they're both saying at the extremes, uh, you can you can find this. Um, and, and and they're not saying they're not doing it like at a Hallmark card. Yeah. Right. They're like you. You have to. You have to practice a lot of. Pra- you have to do a complex ecology of practices that you not only do by yourself, but deeply with other people, honed properly, and then you can make progress on doing this. What we're talking about. Where did we start to lose that? I mean, obviously, religion was something that was big yeah. that kept people in like a common out, like a common practice, right? That was a, and that was bigger in the past centuries. I feel like than yeah, it has yes, been yes. here in in America. Yeah, but, well, I mean, and that provided a place where you would go together. You would yeah. there were certain practices that you guys did each week, and uh, there were you know religious get-togethers and 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 people thinking about their God and thinking with their God. Um, and singing together, yes, yeah, singing together, stuff like that's powerful, man. I've been in a, I've been in a church where people will start, even in an audience with a band sometimes, and but it's specifically at a church sometimes people start singing. It's like it'll open up, you know, it'll make you feel connected, you know, your feelings will just start crying, just start emoting, you know, or feeling something. Yeah. Um. So there's something about that, the the doing something as a community and feeling as a group. Yeah. <clears throat> and also, there's the horizontal, and like in some of the practices that that we do, um, there's the horizontal, like you and I reciprocally open to each other, but the, there's also the vertical. You and I sort of, we're not only opening this way, we're opening vertically uh, as well. Uh, and it's really interesting when you do some of these uh, Socratic practices, uh, dialectic into dialogos, philosophical fellowship, things like that. People who are often not religious at all, secular, they'll get into this and they'll start to feel that collective flow state and mm. that sense of o- reciprocally opening to each other. And then they, they all start talking about like the the third, the, the we space, like the, the, the collective intelligence that neither – it's not coming just from you or from me, but it's being co-created and emerging and taking on a life of its own. Yeah. Right? And, and then they start to talk about this. In, in religious language, and, and and we we lost that. I mean, so that feels like as close as we can get to God. A lot of times, I feel like there's the best. Well, most, people, well, people start saying things like that. It might be God for them, and I I, I want to be really careful here. I'm very respectful of people's religious adherence. Mm-hmm. I, I'm not anti-religious by any means, um, but um, no, neither. But people, well, what happens is 
right? And th this is a, a, a platonic point, a neoplatonic point. So what happens is initially when they're doing these, they get an intimacy with each other, that reciprocal opening. Mm -hmm. They fall in love. It's philia love. It's not, right? But that's in the word philosophy. It's fellowship love mm -hmm. of wisdom, right? They get that. And then they start to feel intimate with this, the geist, the spirit. We call it the logos, the, the right? This, this thing, this emerging collective intelligence that is making everything more intelligible. And people start to reciprocally open with it, right? And then they start to reciprocally open through each other and through th that logos to the depths of reality. Yeah. And then they start to feel like they're in relationship to what is ultimate. And some people think about that as, as God so, and, and, and some, and some people think about God personally. Some people think about God impersonally. Some people think about it more like the ground of being or ultimate reality. But what everybody starts, well, all the people that talk this way, what they're doing is they're trying to express a connection to something that's profoundly, transformatively real and meaningful. And we have a word for that. It's sacred to them. Mm. Now, and there's a deep connection between having a sacred canopy and the cultivation of wisdom. So I'll, I'll, another thing I'll ask my students, where do you go for information? Without thinking, they hold up their smartphones because we're all cyborgs now, yeah. right? Right. And I say, where do you go for knowledge? And they'll sort of like, oh, well, science, the university, but Grandpa. they're- Grandpa. Well, yeah, something, Grandma. right? But then I'll say, and this is where it's really interesting, where do you go for wisdom? And there's an anxious silence. Now, if you'd ask people that 200 years ago, they'd say, oh, my church, my temple, my mosque, my, right, 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 my sangha. And those answers don't come out. Occasionally, very rarely, somebody will say, like, my church, but they'll, sometimes they'll, they'll say it kind of like, but not really. And what's happened is, it's... Mo most so the the the, the largest demo, growing demographic are the nuns, the N O N E S S. They have no official religious identity. Mm. Now that doesn't mean they're overwhelmingly atheists. Most of them are spiritual, but not religious or seekers, or they have weird supernatural beliefs. But so, but what's happened is most people are abandoning religion not primarily because they've come to some deep conclusion that it's false. Although religion has a problem, the religions generally have a problem with the scientific worldview, uh, at least some versions of them. But it's much more, it's, 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 a, it's a little bit of a truth issue, Theo, but it's much more a relevance issue. Most people feel that these institutions are no longer like relevant to them. They're, they're not... They're not vibrant. They're not vital. Yeah. They, they, they don't speak to them. They don't call them to their better self. They don't call them into like these, these, th 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 these, these experiences. And in fact, the ecology of practices has generally withered and we've tended to emphasize like giving each other propositions and reciting them to each other as opposed to this complex set of rituals and ecologies of practices. So, yeah, we as we lost, and I'm not, uh, and I'm not nostalgic. You, you can put this on my tombstone. Neither nostalgia nor utopia. Okay. I'm not nostalgic. I'm not saying we need to go back. Right, right, right. right. No, we're no, just looking at it. Right, we're looking at it. But when we lost that sacred canopy, we we lost a lot. And, you know, Nietzsche said it really well. He said he runs into the marketplace, the madman, and he he doesn't confront Christians. He confronts the atheists who are all sort of tittering about the death of God. And he said, "You don't know what." And Nietzsche's the guy who pronounces the death of God. So he's not hes not there to argue against them as atheists. He said, you don't realize what you've done. You've taken a sponge and you've wiped out the sky, mm. right? You, you've unchained us. Like we're no, we're forever falling. We have to become worthy of this. We like killing God. We have not, it, like to put it in affective terms, we have not grieved to the depths we need to and in a healthy way in order to be worthy of that. That's what he's basically mm. saying. Well, yeah, it's like if you, when you take that type of thing away, right? I mean, and then you take away the religion of the family, right? Like a lot of families have evolved. You see a lot of single parent families. Both parents have to work. You know, the kids are being raised by uh, you know, by their smartphones and by whatever yeah. uh, the yeah. first thing it can yeah. get in, get yeah. to them, and then you take away also. You know, there was a time like in the '90s where like 
uh, everything kind of like, and this is a smaller version, but everything is like, you can watch or consume whatever you want when you want it. Yeah. There used to be like- Shared. We would, networks. Yeah, shared experiences, right? They were right? called we networks would, for a reason, right? Yes. We were a network together. Yeah. We would all watch a show and then we would go out on the street and like impersonate the characters from it. Yep. We would, uh, like you were excited as soon as the show went uh, was over, especially in the summer because it was still light outside. We'd go outside and like impersonate our favorite acts from it. We'd all laugh and have like a shared experience. Whereas now everybody- It's fragmented. Yeah, everybody's just like watching whatever when they want. It's all separate. You don't really feel a connection. I think that's that's profoundly right. That's what I meant earlier about how popular culture used to have a religious function, religio, to bind together. It's we, It used to do that. And now we've even lost that dimension. I, I think I, I think well, yeah. how do we get back from there? Do we get back from there? or is this like an evolutionary time where how we meet and the things that the glues that connect us or make us feel like part of a society or part of a universe or existence that they're just being challenged like, I mean, they're always being challenged, but do you think there's a way out of this kind of space or do you think we're in like a never before? I do think there's a way out. And I like, so a big chunk of my scientific work, my work as a scientist is to try and figure out what is this meaning making machinery? What is wisdom? Um, how can we get uh, a better understanding so we can cultivate it better, but also working with communities of practice, practitioners, leaders of these communities. I've done a lot of participant observation. I've done a lot of parti uh, participant uh, experimentation. I did uh, uh, Rafik Kelly's uh, Return to the Source last July. Um, uh, it, is that a series? Is that a... Uh, you go out, it? and it's an ecology of practice, evolve, move, play. He's been very influenced first by Jordan Peterson's work, and then more so uh, more recently, and uh, I think he would say more in depth by my work. Um, and, and we'll put links to all of these things that he's mentioning and talking about. We're going to put links to those in the uh, in the information on YouTube, so you guys will be able to access these different things. Go on, sorry. So, so you know, and what what you have is you you have um, so we, like say there's a father or mother out there, right? And well, they, they're in charge of their home, right? How, and they want to have a different future. They want their, yeah. you know, what can, what do they do? What do they start to do like auto, like as a person or as a leader of a home that can help? Yeah. So good, good. Here's the answer. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, I, I, I'm enthusiastic. Don't misread my, <laughs> my energy for like, I know, like I, I hope I have. No, look, we're <laughs> waiting. Look, we're waiting, John. Okay. So. Like and we're, this comes from work I've done with Nathan Vanderpool and uh, and other people. Like, uh, like I said, I've done a, I've both. I've 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 been in the room virtually or uh, in person with all of the scientists, and we all sat in a room and we, what is wisdom? And we really we produced a consensus paper, and then I've done I go you know do lots of participant observation, and we got all the a lot of the leaders of the community together in one room, and we did a bunch of. Like discussion and practice, and we're gonna. I'm gonna go to another one uh, next week in fr uh, France. Um, or same thing, and 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 so what's coming out of it is like there's there's sort of three dimensions you want to pay attention to. You want to pay attention to view, care, and action. You want to pay. Remember that framing. You want to do. A, you want to really become aware of how you're framing, and you want to be become really aware of that process of, of how you're assuming and assi assigning identities. Stop letting all of that go on mindlessly, automatically, reactively. Try and, you gotta bring it more into your awareness, mm -hmm. right? That's view. Care, reciprocal opening. You gotta learn how to reciprocally open, how to, you know. What, communicate, share information, accept information? Is that what you mean by uh, that? Yeah, but also reciprocally open. You need, you need, one of the defining features of wisdom is an ability to take other people's perspective in a way that makes a difference to how you're behaving. Like, mm, I don't understand. So, you and I, right? You can know that you can know as a set of facts, John's different. He thinks differently than me. But you can have this kind of moment. Let's, let's say it's not me, where you go, "Oh, I thought she was angry, but she's actually afraid." Mm. 
You have to you have to cultivate that kind of uh, Daniel Siegel calls it mindsight, like insight into other people's minds, and not just facts about their mind, but the ability to get their world and where they're coming from, so that you can be responsive and responsible to it. Mm. You care, and then that automatically those two you can now see why they lead to the third thing: action. How are you interacting? And you want to be doing that so you can tune in to connections. How are you connected to yourself? How are you connected to other people? How are you connected to the world? And how are you connected to something ultimate that gives a verticality to your existence? And then you want to cultivate an ecology of practices in four domains. We call it dime. You want dialogical practices, this dialectic into dialogus, and we run workshops on that, and there's a whole bunch. There's circling practices. There's, this is all over the place. So people are trying to get back this kind, what's happening between you and I, where it takes on a life of its own, and we both get to a place we couldn't get to on our own, and it's emergent and it's transformative. Mm, yeah. Then you want the imaginal. You have to, remember we talked about the experiment? Mm -hmm. with. You have to learn how to properly use your imagination again. Yeah, that's disappearing, huh? It's yeah. almost an extinct animal, the imagination. And we also what, what and we've also we've also relegated it to something that where we're looking to, I want to compare two different senses of imagination. One is the imaginary. This is Henri Corbin. He's a, he was a philosopher. Um and that's like when I you picture something in your mind like picture a sailboat. Yeah. And does, okay. Does it have are the sails up or down? Mm, it's uh, in a shop. Okay, so there you go. Now that's one thing. Now I want you to consider that in comparison to this. So a, a kid picks up a stick, ties a blanket around them, and says, I'm Zorro. Mm -hmm. They're not picturing anything in their mind. What they're doing is they're trying to take the perspective and the identity, the stuff we were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. of Zorro. They're trying on what it's like to be Zorro in order to see if they can catch any of his virtues. That's ah. serious play. That's what you do in ritual. You do that imaginally augmented awareness. Yeah. So when I'm teaching people Tai Chi, right, and they're novices, and you have to teach them how to inhabit their body differently. You say to them, okay, I want you to imagine you're standing in a, a shallow river and your knees to your feet are sinking into the mud. You want to have that sinking feeling there. Your knees to your, your navel are like the flowing water. You want this to feel like flowing water. Right? And then from your navel up, this is like the air. You want it to feel as insubstantial as possible. And when people are doing that, they're imaginally augmenting so they can become aware of very subtle patterns, sensory motor patterns that they were, would otherwise be uh, unaware of. And they can re-inhabit themselves in a new way. And a new possibility, a new developmental pathway opens for them. That's mm. the imaginal. You have to, and that's what ritual properly does. Right? So you, you need the dialogical. You need the imaginal. You need mindfulness practices. You need meditative practices and contemplative practices. They're not the same thing. You need seated versions. You need moving versions. You got to create that ecology, right? And then you need embodiment in practices. You need practices that involve you, right? Knowing through your body, being embedded in your environment, negotiating with the world. So Rafe, Kelly, you evolve, move, play. You go, you do parkour in the wilderness, so you get nature connection and you're also moving your body and, and having it be challenged. So it's not a postcard that you sit back like a Monet painting, oh, isn't that lovely? I just really like, no, it's challenging you. Mm -hmm. It's forcing you to transcend. I When I was there, I'm like I'm like 60 and I'm there with all these 20 somethings, right? Mm -hmm. and, and like, <laughs> right, and and and, uh, and and I talked about every day you went to the horizon of horror. You take, and they were they're so good at like taking you to this place where it's like, oh, I'm really scared. I made a vow to myself. I said, no matter what it is, there's a couple things I can't do because of my meniers. And I took, I took, I said, other than those things, anything that's presented to me, I'm going to do it. And the more afraid I am, the more I'm going to do oh, it. Oh yeah. I did that today. I went, I got in the ice. I have an ice bath here and I got in. I didn't really want to, but I was like, I need something. I just want to alter. I just want to challenge my perception today. Yeah. I want to do something I don't want to do. It's something small, but it's like doing that thing that you don't want to do or putting yourself up, just committing to it, you know? Do you think we used to get so much more out of that just in our system? Because if it seems like these things that you're speaking of are things that seem like necessities to our soul, you know? They are. Like nothing seems more thirsty these days than like our soul, like whatever. There's like some, I almost can feel this part of underneath me all, a lot of times just almost like my soul is trying to order per like 
oxycons or something. It's like, dude, yeah. what am I like? What am I even doing here anymore? If these are the practices we're doing a lot of times, it's like you can start to feel it feels bored, you know, or it feels like well, thirsty. It, what That's it's, a better word. It doesn't feel bored. It feels thirsty. Well, it, it, yeah, thirsty, and uh, but it can vacillate between profound boredom and extreme anxiety. Like so, you get the and, and by the way, thirst. That's the. That's the, that the the word that's actually used in the Buddhist scriptures for what's usually translated as desire. It's it's more like thirst and craving. It's not simple desire. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, and, and, and that that craving, um, uh, when uh, it's that reciprocal narrowing, it's identifying in a mindless fact. It's all that stuff we talk about. Mm -hmm. it, uh, and I, I I like I like the contrast that I'm I'm playing around with it in my mind. It's like we have to learn to not thirst because we properly nourish our souls. And when you get people to do these four, like these three dimensions, view, care, action, and do dime, you know, dialogical, imaginal, mindfulness, embodied, Im embedded, extended, enacted, all that stuff, emotional too, all the E's, right? right? And they do it not only individually, but collectively, right? Then people start to talk about that nourishment. And that nourishment, that's where the, the language your, uh, your, your soul is sort of your vehicle, your way of being profoundly connected, right? Mm -hmm. um, or, and, and sometimes people make a distinction between your soul is sort of how you're profoundly connected like to your body and, to, and you're grounded. And then your spirit is how you're profoundly connected to that capacity for leaping oh, into the sky, okay. right? And, and, and then yourself, yourself is paradoxically how you're profoundly connected to other. We only become selves through other people. If you're if you're raised in isolation, you don't become a self. You don't become a person. We become selves. You know, we become selves by. I, I'm taking a perspective right now, right? And you're taking a perspective on my perspective. What a kid does, and this this is like the Zorro, the mm -hmm. imaginal. The kid, imaginally, not imagine imaginatively, but imaginally, right? right? The kid will try and take on the perspective of the teacher or the parent. That's why, and they'll imitate them, mm -hmm. right? And eventually, they can imitate them to the point they indwell that that parent's perspective, and then they imitate it more and more and more. And what that means is they start to be able to do that for themselves. They start to internalize that. And what what does the parent's perspective have that the kid's perspective doesn't? The parent's perspective can see the biases that the kid's perspective has the kid can't see it because right. they're in the bio, they're in the perspective and the parents perspective can also see broader deeper goals that the kids perspective can't see and so this is by Vygotsky and other people's notions by internalizing the perspective of the parent they get a capacity to take a perspective on their own perspective taking mm. and that's how they start to become a self-aware agent if you ask a three-year-old even a three and a half year old what's going on in your head right now they'll say blood Blood. They, they they can't introspect. Oh yeah. But and I I kept, I kept track of this with my younger son. It must be bad if your father is a cognitive scientist. But oh yeah, the it, kid's not gonna. gonna be. <laughs> but I kept track of the first time, he, the first two times he introspected. He was four and a bit, and we were driving in the car, and he said, "Daddy, it's snowing outside, but only in my head." And he, oh, he's imagining it, right? And he's re, and he can introspect. He's got that interior imaginal space because there's no literal space inside your head. Yeah. And then the other time is he came up to me and he said, I have a backwards camera in my head. And I went, what? What does that mean? And then I realized he was saying he has autobiographical memory. He can go, he can remember his past. Mm. And then I, this is great. I said to him, does anybody else have that? And he said, no, only me. <laughs> <laughs> right? So we become <laughs> capable of introspecting reflecting on ourselves, mm. correcting ourselves, transcending ourselves through other people. We become selves through each other. And so the soul is perhaps, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to rehabilitate these terms so we can re-inhabit them. And there's a connection between those two words, rehabilitate, re-inhabit, right? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to rehabilitate the notion of soul. This is how we, right? This is our deep connectedness to our embodiment, to our groundedness. Our self is our deep connectedness to each other, and our spirit is our deep connectedness to the vertical, to what is ultimate. And if we could bring those back so that they can be simultaneously scientifically understood, remember Socrates, and spiritually transformatively real for us again, then we can do that nourishment you were talking about.
And I think it's going to become, it's a necessity. I think it is. That's what I think. It, I don't know if that part of us can die. The part of us that is desperate for um, these, th just like this understanding or this comfort or this peace, not even like the comfort of a blanket or no. of, uh, but the comfort of just some connection to this greater energy that we're supposed to be yeah. like working with, you know? Um, so we're just talking about like how that, that we need each other, right? Yeah. We need each other. And what's interesting I've noticed about time recently, especially since like uh, social media the, and the computer, really the sense of smartphone is we almost... I started to notice this with reality television, right? Like, so people would watch a show that was on reality television. Do they have it in Canada, reality yes, TV? Yes. yes. Yeah. So people would watch it. We, we, we pretty much have everything you have. Okay. Um, well, you don't want everything we have. So. No, no. And, and we also get some of the stuff that we, we don't want to have, but we still get it anyway. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and I want to apologize about that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but like people were originally where they would watch a reality show because the shows were like trying to capture like people in their real lives behaving yeah. a certain way. But then after like a generation had gone on for some of those shows that were still on. It all became bullshit. Yeah. Well, the people were now they'd seen people behave a certain way. So they were now just being the characters yeah. that they'd already seen. They right? went on script. Yeah. Right. Totally. And they don't even do it by by. They, well, you couldn't really have reality TV anymore because the people that grew up watching it were now just impersonate. They, they were impersonating what they'd seen. Yeah. So now the next contestant, a generation later, on these same shows, were just impersonating what they. So I, I just, and I notice it even with like trends, like they'll have on social media. People will be like, "Okay, we'll do this dance, do this thing." I just wonder, do we start to get in this? because of the mirror of social media and of our cell phone where we're just impersonating yeah, yeah where we're not even like how far are we getting from like original ideas and thoughts if if of if generation over generation we just start to impersonate what we've already seen yeah i mean and that's a problem and plato actually starts worrying about that problem way back just with really? the with the invention of writing uh and alphabetic writing yeah i mean what one of the things that happens is um like Baudrillard and the you know Simulcra, we we we, we hyper reality and we we start to get we start to get, our capacity for abstract uh, imaginary symbolic thought, which is one of our great gifts. Yeah, is also it's adaptive, so it is also something that can be a vehicle of tremendous self deception. It can cut us off in powerful ways, and one of the ways in which that ability can get sort of twisted and hijacked is um, it's an idea from Eric Fromm that he got from the Stoics. We were talking about the mm -hmm. Stoics earlier. Um, and so remember when I was talking about, you know, we're always ass assuming identities and assigning identities. Mm -hmm. and, that, and I have an agent arena relationship. That's my existential mode. Is, 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 I'll just that's the that's the language we use for talking about that. Okay, that's when your, you say agent arena, what does that mean? Just that means it. that means I, I'm assuming a certain identity so mm -hmm. I can act as an agent. I can pursue goals, solve problems. So right, and the arena is uh, the world has the world makes sense and is shaped. So I don't go. I don't go in with a tennis racket with my tennis skills into a football stadium. Right. I see right. what you're saying. Like yeah. when I go into a gas station, I go in there and I uh, I'm a patron. So I don't act like a police officer when I'm in. Exactly. There. I exactly. I act like a patron in a gas station right. because that's what fits the world that I'm in. It, so that's the agent in the arena. And we can often forget that. Uh, and so one of the personal problems I've wrestled with, and I'm still wrestling with it, is. I will tend to carry the professor persona into areas where it doesn't belong. Oh, I see. Right? And so we, we that's what I mean of when we're doing it unconsciously, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's your existential mode when you're doing all of that. Is that okay? We can do yeah. that. Okay, and so Fromm talked about sort of two modes we have, and the modes are both needed, uh, and, they're, and they're both organized around different kinds of needs. So one mode he called the having mode. This is the mode that 
in which you need to have something. You need to have water. You need to have oxygen. And it means you need to control it, consume it, and you, you need to have a categorical relationship with it, like uh, like water. It just has to be water. It doesn't have to be like this particular water. It just has to be healthy water, right? And so what I, what I do is I'm manipulating and I'm using my intelligence and I'm manipulating and controlling the world, and I, I have what Buber would call an I-it relationship. I'm only relating to this as an it, as, mm-hmm. as, a, as a member of a category, right? And that's important because they, like if you, don't, if you don't have that mode, you're dead. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, there's another mode. He called it the being mode. I'm not totally thrilled with that. This is the mode. These are the needs that are met not by having something but by becoming something. So you need to be mature. You need to be in love. Notice how we say we have sex, but mm-hmm. you want to be in love, mm-hmm. right? Um, and, and, and that's a different mode. So in that mode, I'm not trying to control and manipulate the world. I'm trying to reciprocally open it. So I, I strive to have that relationship with my friends and most importantly with my best friend and partner, uh, Sara, right? If I, if I treated Sara like a member of a category, well, Sara, the reason I'm with you is you remind me of all the other women I've been with. I know how to manipulate and control you and use you to satisfy my needs. That just ended the relationship. What yeah. she wants yeah. is, no, no, you're not a problem that I'm going to solve. You're a mystery that I'm going to constantly be faithful to, mm. right? And and that and that's where I'm using not my intelligence. I'm using from means reason, but in Plato's sense, not in the modern logical sense. He means that capacity to challenge self-deception and to try and reciprocally open with something. So those are your being needs, Mm -hmm. right? And and those are important too. And you need both, right? Because you want to have water and you want to be mature. You you want food and you want to be honest, right? Um, The problem we get, Fromm says, especially if we're not paying attention to our existential mode is we will pursue the needs in the wrong frame. So for example, a being need, maturity. Instead of I'm going to become mature, I'm going to have a car. Instead of being in love, I'm going to have lots of sex. Mm, I see. Right? And this, this is modal confusion. Your existential modes are confused. And when that happens, we confuse. So we put ha- quantity on equality, kind of. That's yes, a, yes. Kind of a blanket statement, but I see, yes. So let's back to your point. Social media, what you want is you have a being need. You need to be in relationship with people, but now you have connections. Mm. You need to be real, but now you have a script. Do you see what keeps happening? What happens, and, and Fromm's point is our culture, right, is is largely he called it the like Fromm's a Marxist. I'm not a Marxist, but he 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 called it the market character, right? He he said what what happens is we we are increasingly led to trying to pursue not only our having modes but all of our being needs from within the having mode. Because if I can get you to pursue your being needs within the having mode, I can sell you stuff. I can sell you stuff. I can sell you ideas. I can manipulate you with political ideas. So there's a lot to be gained by bullshitting you, right? Constantly keeping you with salience, but you don't ever pursue the truth of what your needs really are, right? right? But constantly giving you the salience and, and drawing you in Right. But but there's a we benefit that in a, in a way because if I continue to bite at the fool's gold bait, yes. right, of those types of things, if I continue to, it keeps me away from really having to look at myself. Yes. So because it it can be very painful yes. to really sit and That's, look at myself and my history and my past yes. if I'm not doing it in a loving way and an accepting way. And think about how that's made even worse. That's that's astute what you just said. So there's a there's an outer dimension of how we're being misled, and then there's the inner dimension of how we're avoidant. And think about how hard it is for you to confront pain if you don't have a sacred canopy, an ecology mm. of practice that can give meaning to the pain. People can undergo tremendous pain it is if it is made meaningful to them. I'm I'm, I'm working with somebody right now. She's done interventions around pain man and like like. People, like people, think about, here, let me give you a, a, a reason. A, 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 so what are the things people, oh, I want money and I want to feel comfortable. I want to feel sort of good. Uh, you know, I want good sleep, good health. You know, I want my partner and I to get along really well. You know what will destroy all of those? Have a kid. Yeah. 
have a child. Your health goes down, your finances go down, right? You're sick all the time. You're wet for some reason all the time. There's alarms going off. You don't sleep. Each partner, each partner's, <laughs> yeah. conv- each partner's convinced the other one's not doing enough work. And you ask people, why do you do that? Why do you give up on all of those things? And they'll say, because having a kid is so meaningful. Remember, mm. I'm connected to something that has a reality and a value beyond my egocentric concerns. I want it to exist even if I don't, and I want to care for it. I want to make a difference to it. And it's magical. Like if you love a child, right, you turn this being, I mean, they're morally pers- people right from the beginning, but you cognitively, they're not people, yeah. right? And you, it's, it's like magic. You love them and they turn into persons, yeah. right? And, and like, it's just, right? And so- when people can go, they will sacrifice a lot if they have a reasonable hope that there'll be meaning in it. Mm. But if we're in a meaning crisis and meaning scarcity, they won't make any of those sacrifices. They won't face pain. Don't tell somebody face your pain, feel your emotions. If they can't bring meaning to it, if they can't have practices to confront it and, mm. and bring wise discernment. So you're right. It makes it even worse. So not only are they being bullshitted from without, they're being starved your nourishment metaphor, they're being starved within of the meaning that would allow them to make that confrontation. And you're right, those two things feed on each other and we get really reciprocally narrow. We get really bound into this profound modal confusion. And like you said, it's fool's gold. It's not actually satisfying it. So we pursue, I need more cars, I need more sex, I need more drugs, whatever it is. And then we get lost in a profound way. Well, we're at the end of the line with it, it feels like. I mean, we're watching, there's television shows called American Greed. It's like, yeah. we're sitting here watching the, you know, we're watching like every hero become comes a villain because they fall to their own devices of um, addictions or small things, yes. that whatever little things that yeah. they let fester while they were uh, ch- uh, trying to achieve grandeur. It's like we're just realizing that there's no, I think the avenue of this well, from- capitalistic, I don't know what it is. I can't yeah. figure out what it is that's led us so astray though sometimes. But I think we are as a group are realizing that it's that we are astray. It feels I, I, like. I think so too. And and you know, and Fromm predicted, he predicted that eventually our in, he 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 made the argument that when we're in profound modal confusion, what we would eventually do, and he was part of the person that inspired me when I made that prediction I talked about earlier, is we will seek the last connection we have with reality, which mm. is violent destructiveness. If I can't connect to it, the last connection I can have is at least I will be the one that destroys it. Wow. Mm, he, he, he predict- really? Yes. Think of movie Joker, right? And just how that movie's just, it's almost like a hymn to that. Yeah, I mean, think of, look at schools, people walking into schools and shooting people. That's a <sighs> symptom of the meaning crisis. Look at suicide. Look at, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we had a corner on and he was saying the number one cause of death in uh, black communities is gun violence. The number one cause of death in white communities is uh, overdosing. Yeah. It's like people are just finding a mean, yep. you know, there's, we're at, a, it feels like we're in a cul-de-sac. See, see uh, uh, the, of hope in a way. Yeah, I think so. We're in a place where, uh, like we're really, we're, we're, we're narrowed down, we're locked in. Uh, but like I said, there's also, those are all the negative symptoms. Right, right. And I know, I, and I hate to be, ne- I don't want to try to be too negative either. No, there's positive symptoms too, yeah. right? Uh, and like, if you look, and I'm just using an analogy, if you look at a disease, you look not at only the negative symptoms, you look at how the body's trying to heal itself, how it's trying to repair, because that might give you hope, rational hope for how you could actually cure the disease. But you see other things happening. Like, and, 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 and even in those things, you'll see the mixture. So the mindfulness revolution uh, is, like I, I think I was the first person to teach about mindfulness academically at the University of Toronto. And I had to sort of introduce it like within the middle of another lecture. And I'm just talking about mindfulness. And here, there's actually a lot of experimental work. And uh, right <laughs> now everybody talks about it. There's journals. And, and But the mindfulness revolution is an attempt to start bringing yeah. back the cultivation. Now, it's also getting commodified. We have what's now called mic mindfulness. Mindfulness, if you look in, in the cultures, like if you look in Buddhist cultures, or you even look back into Christian Neoplatonism, the, the monastic traditions, mindfulness is this rich ecology of practices. There's meditative practices, contemplative practices, right? There's seated practices. There's, there's all this, right? And then what we did is we took one practice, meditation, 
sit in meditation, and we said, that's all mindfulness is. And then we took it out of that rich thing. We took it out of the broader framework of mm. ethical practices and philosophical practices. So it's not about transforming you in the world. It's about making you contented with being a corporate, being a corporate drone, right? And so, but still, there's a positive, you see what I mean? There's a positive and negative in there. The stoicism is going through a huge revival right yeah. now, right? There's, there's like, there's a revival of interest in Eastern Orthodox Christianity because I think one of the reasons I've had great conversations with both Jonathan Pajot and Bishop, Bishop Maximus, both good friends of mine, um, because uh, Eastern Orthodox Christianity has the imaginal in it and has Neoplatonism in it. So, so imagine if you took Plato and Aristotle and the Stoics and you integrated them together. So not, not only was it a great philosophical system, it was a profound ecology of practices. That's Neoplatonism, mm. and that's what's coming back. I consider myself a Neoplatonist, right? And so there's there's lots of, there's all these dialogical communities emerging. There's things like Rafe's Evolve, Move, Play. There's Guy Senstock circling. There's the work that Taylor Barrett does, like all the stuff we're doing, and, and we're just one amongst many. Yeah. It's, well, it's interesting to hear people, you know, uh, yeah, people are thirsty for something. They're thirsty for something new, I think, or they're just a new being and they're thirsty for something. Well, well you know, that's the thing. And, and Plato had this weird thing where he said, you don't really learn. It's, you're just always remembering something you, you, you didn't know, but you did know. It's, it's just, and, and people have sort of struggled with this. But here's something that people say when we're doing the, like the dialectic into the logos or the philosophical fellowship. They'll say things like, that's a form of intimacy I never knew about, but I realized I've always been looking for. Mm. That's what they say. And it's so, and that's so paradoxical to hear, but when you're in it, you, you understand perfectly what they're talking about. They broke that modal confusion. They break through it. Dirk Brook, they break, you know, Meister Eckhart, they break through it, right? He's a Christian Neoplatonist. They break through and they break through the modal confusion. And so they were hungry for it, but they're framing Hadn't been well. That's one of the things I love about going to a lot of different recovery meetings. Sometimes you sit in there, you're just waiting for somebody to say something yeah. the way that you have always wanted to say it, but you couldn't put like the seven or eight words Isn't together. that a gift when that happens? It's unbelievable. And I'll go three or four times a week just hoping to hear one guy says something and I will literally feel like <sighs> my body will do that. And you can hear, sometimes hear other people in the room. It's almost like that's a the embodiment collective about, sigh. Yes. Like, that's amazing. Yes, that's the embodiment, right? And, and that's the soul, right? And there's also the spirit. You're both getting to a place you couldn't get to on your own. And, and I'm going to use this word, and I, and I don't, I don't, I mean it positively, and I'm not trying to slot you, but, you know, those are the recovery meetings. And I, I've done, you know, I've, done, I've attended AA and some other things, uh, uh, but and many of them are explicitly, at least, were born in a religious frame. But they're religious practices in the way we've been talking about. You're yeah. cultivating wisdom and transformation, how to face yourself, how to cultivate connection, right? This is, and you're doing it individually and collectively, mm -hmm. right? And yes, and 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 I notice, and this is not this is an observation; it's not a criticism. Like you keep returning to this as a lived example, in your body lived example of what we're talking about, Yeah. right? And so, but that, th what I'm asking you to now consider is there's lots of possible, there's lots of variations on this theme that are arising everywhere and they're getting scientific understanding. They're networking into a, a, a subculture and that gives me rational hope. Mm. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's, it's, the th it's the thing like when things get bad, they're always throughout time it seems like there's always been like uh in every story there's the moment where you think things are where things get bad and they get good it's like it's that feeling inside of you that this has to end well i think that that little pilot light of that oh, yeah it feels like it per, it perseveres no matter what you know um well it can get blown out uh we do some work with, I, I agree with you about that pilot light. 
by the way, think of it not just as a pilot light, but like what a pilot used to be, or a pilot of an airplane or a pilot of a ship, right? It's a guiding light, mm -hmm. uh, right? Well, I think it's not even my own pilot light, but I think it's the collective pilot ah, light. That, that's, that's the one that I feel like wins in the end. Yeah. I don't know if us as individuals, if we win. That's an excellent distinction because we're doing some work, myself and some of uh, my, my colleagues, graduate students, of vets who have post-traumatic stress disorder. And their, their internal light in, in some sense been blown out. But I like what you said. One of the things we're trying to do is see if they can catch it from each other again. Mm. And try and bring about interventions that can bring that about. So remember I mentioned Paul Tillich, the courage to be, he had a, there's a Greek word for this and it's from the Christian tradition. Um, it's kairos, and it means it, it means the right timing that where, where the 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 time where time where the course of things turns, and the mm. kairos is always a place in which multiple opportunities. So, like you know, the, you know, the Bronze Age collapse, civilizations can collapse too, right? And so, right, the, yeah, we're at this very crucial time now. The 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 it's a dangerous time. But the advantage of a Kairos is, okay, when everything is going really well, a system is really stable and it has a lot of inertia and it's hard to make a difference. But when things are breaking up, this is called self-organizing criticality, mm. then individuals can make a difference that they can't you normally make when things – so don't look at like, well, things have always been this way because if we're actually in a crisis, a Kairos, then your capacity as an individual to make a difference has been increased. Wow. Man, that's awesome. You know, that's really awesome, man. And that's something that I think, yeah, I'm grateful to hear that today, you know, and I think, and, and not to give us the insight that we are gods or that we, but just that you can, this is never has the road been set more when you can have an impact. That's right. You know, that's because right. that's just the way that the chips are stacked. So what a blessing for you to be able to have an impact right now. If you do something good, if you do something positive, if you choose to take the road that builds up your, um, self-worth more than the 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 just uh, uh feeling good in the moment you yeah. know um that's that's inspiring man what when you think of like what about like love like people look at love a lot you know yes. have you been in love before i'm in love right now okay so you have a partner now and y'all have children no i i i've i've i have Children from a previous marriage. She has children from a previous marriage, and we're we're done. We've raised children. Her, her two children. Who two? Her two children are adults. My two children are now adults. They're, okay, they're but y'all have you've had children though. Yeah, yeah. And there's uh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, but I am in love now. Um, and I also love uh, uh like uh my kids. I, I I love my friends. Um, but, but I've also been learning to love the world mm. and reality and being. And in that sense, like agape, you know, the love that makes us, like we were talking about earlier, the love that turns us into human beings. You know, the, the Bible, I'm not a Christian, but the Bible said, you know, God is agape. Like finding that reciprocal opening, that sacredness, finding the deep connections between logos, that spirit of making sense of things that emerges between people, the agape by which we make each other into people, but it also connects us deeper to reality. The, the, the deep within is calling to the deep without, and they, they call to each other. I'm, I'm in love with all of that. Yeah. Did you, um, do you think that, uh, Theo, I think, I think if, if you ask me in the elevator, John, you have 20 seconds. Mm -hmm. This is what I would say. Learn to love wisely. That's it. It's the, like, it's really hard. Most of my failings have become I mean, that I did not love wisely. Mm. I love foolishly. I think you could understand sin as a failure to love wisely. Mm. Sorry, I interrupted you, but I just, wanted no. to, I just wanted to express that. No, I appreciate you expressing that. Yeah, I think I've done that a lot of times. I think sometimes it's there's things that are easier to love and it's not even love it's not even love it's like a lust even of your imagination yeah or even if you can lo anything can lust it doesn't have to be just like of your groin or whatever you know yeah it can be of of any you can fame yeah. fame yeah fame food yeah. food you, sugar oh yeah i went through that yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Oh God, dude! I eat a whole bag of damn Dove dark chocolates, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. and I'll do it again sometimes. I miss the chocolate. It's one of the things I had to give up when I was diagnosed with diabetes. Oh God, dude! They <laughs> get you. Um, 
yeah, how crucial is that to people to 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 the success of their survival? Do you think love? Well, I I mean, again, lust it lust is when we're pursuing love from the having mode, right? right? Okay. So you 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 need to have sex. Uh, like, I mean, we we got into the mistake of thinking, no, no, we don't need that. That and that mess that messes people up. Yeah. Right. And then we do the other thing. No, 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 no. You need like you'll get love by just having lots of sex, and that that now we're in that the other. We oh, swing the other way. Right. And so, I mean, love is love is like love. Like, the, the thing is, we're really confused. First of all, love isn't a feeling. Um, you know, uh, I, I'm in love with Sarah right now, and until I mentioned those words, I wasn't feeling anything. Right. Right. Love isn't an emotion. Uh, I'm in love with Sarah. And sometimes that makes me sad. I miss her right now a lot, right? Sometimes it makes me angry. You're threatening Sara. I'm no. You're not going to do that, right? And sometimes it makes me really happy. Sometimes it makes me very thoughtful. Wow, I I, I just realized I really don't know her, and that's wonderful. So love isn't even an emotion. Love is an existential stance. It's uh, I am you and I. We're going to religio. We're going to bind ourselves so we reciprocally open. So you draw the best out in me, I draw the best out in you, you transcend yourself through me, and I transcend myself through you, and we keep realizing that that is such amazing mystery that it keeps happening, we're gonna be faithful to it. It's a commitment. Yeah, it's a commitment, but it's it's not a commit, like the Greeks had- the But Greeks, it's not a prison. No, but, and the Greeks, had, the, the Greeks have two words, right? There's in kratia, mm -hmm. like democracy, kratia, power. So in kratia is when you, you commit by like, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna eat the chocolate. I'm not gonna do it. I'm not gonna do it. I'm not gonna do it. That's in Kratia. Sofrasin, Sofrasin is different. Sofrasin is like this. Um, Saint Paul talks about when he does the hymn to Agape. When I was a, when I was a child, I thought like a child. I acted like a child. But then when I became an adult, I put childish things behind me. As the child is to the adult, the adult is to the sage. Mm. Right. So. When, when you're a kid, you have two gods, candy and toys. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of the greatest things I did philosophically with my, when, when my, with my younger son is I came to him one day and I said, which is more important, toys or candy? Mm, and he looked at me like, finally dad is asking me something intelligent. Right. And he even, he even, said, like, he even <laughs> did like, give me a moment, I wanna think, right? I was like, okay. And then he came back to me and he said, toys because you can get sick of candy. And I thought, ah, oh, that's my son. Oh, right? There's a philosopher in there somewhere. Right? Um, and so, right, but n notice what, and I used to play with him all the time. And it's a weird thing when you're in adult because like, I remember one of my friends told me, he remembered the day when the toys died. When they, they, like, because what happens is when you're, when you're a kid, toys are super salient to you, right? My, to my son, when he was young, he used to have that, like a toy tower where all the MC figurines are there and everything. Like, in, like to get him to, he would forego urinating and eating to play, right, with yeah. his toys, right? Now, I would play with him, but I don't have that, you know, because I'm, I, I hope I'm an adult, I'm a man. And I don't have to sort of resist. I don't have to go, no, I won't play with the toys. No, I won't. Play. I've matured what I find salient. We call that a salience landscape. I've matured what I find salient, how I connect to things. And salient so, means just to make it clear. How things grab your attention, how okay. they stand out for you, how Got they it. catch you. Got it. Right? And so- like I know logically, I could pick up the toys and play the, this is more, but it doesn't it doesn't draw me. See, Sofrasun, that's Sofrasun. You 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 want it. You want to commit not encratically. I'm not going to cheat on my partner. You want to you want to commit Sofrasun. It's like I'm constantly tempted by the good. I'm constantly flowing. It it comes like second nature to me to 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 have this commitment, like. Frankfurt called lo love a voluntary necessity, mm. which is a brilliant way of putting it. Do you see what I mean? Because we have the 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 problem we we have is we can, and, and and this this messes people up. This is why this is why I wanted to speak to this. We people, I think commitment's the right word. The problem is we often. When we hear commitment, we think of duty, and then we fall into a kratia, and we, I'm going to force myself to stay with this person, mm. right? Now you have to tough it out at times, but right in the end, you want to mature in a relationship so that the commitment is sofrasin, right? And, right, so it's, it's reciprocal, yeah, and it's opening, and you're being drawn into it rather than 
forcing yourself. It's like it's like when you're meditating. Initially, you're sort of constantly trying to keep your attention on the breath, and it's like concentrate, like the word. You're forcing things into the center, right? But what you get is you get to the, where it flips, and instead of doing that, you're constantly instead being reinterested and being drawn into what you're focusing your attention on, entering the stream, mm. as they talk about. Right? You want to enter the stream in your what well, love it like infatuation is the, the 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 momentary madness that gives us a foretaste that we can properly play with of how that can happen. But the problem is we can't stay in infatuation. And you have to what, what infatuation does is it says, okay, see how you could get into this reciprocal opening with somebody? Now this is candy. Find out how to make it food, basically. Mm. That's the other problem we have in our culture. Our, the romantic comedies have told us that the most important, not only do they tell us that this weird bullshit story that the universe will conspire to bring you the person you should be with. No, it won't. No, it won't. Yeah, the universe is not like one of the, it's not like a, a lazy Susan. No, exactly. And, and, and the other thing it tells you is, right, the best part of love is the, is the falling in love part. No, it's not. Infatuation, right? Inf infatuation is to shake your world up enough, right, so that you could cultivate that commitment so that it becomes, you're constantly tempted to fall in love with the person again and again and again. Ah, and that's what I thought was interesting that you said in the beginning was that when you were talking about your partner, about your wife, um, that you said, if there's something new I see about her or that she's a mystery, you yes. know? continuing to perceive that person as a mystery, really, or, or to uh, look at them as a mystery, it just makes it, it it's going to make every day or every week, whatever, a, a, like a new episode. It's not going to, yeah. you're not going to just be playing the same episode over and over, giving you're giving your framework, your framing as a, as a perspective to, oh, let me see what else new I could learn or see about this person or exactly. a new way that I can relate to them. That's pretty fascinating. Well, so confronting a mystery, here, confronting a mystery rather than, here, here. This is what will. This is this is how you know your relationship is doomed if you turn your partner into a problem to be solved, mm. rather than a mystery to constantly face and be faithful to. Wow, to be faithful to a mystery too. That's a pretty brave thing, you know. Well, it's exciting. Think, it's cool. It's cool though. I think it's neat. I think that's the what I, I again try to rehabilitate the notion of faith. Instead of faith being asserting propositions, yeah. pretending that you have certainty, even though you don't have evidence. What about we reconsider faith as faithfulness to the mystery of being, so that we continually fall in love with reality in increasing depths within and without? Why don't we make faith? faithfulness as opposed to I'm going to say things that have no evidence and I'm going to pretend that I'm certain about them. I think that's a that's a really modern and it's not the ancient notion of faith. And that's one of the things, again, we lost. We've lost faith as a profound faithfulness. Do you think, because you're a smart guy, do you think it uh, is, which well, is okay. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> Some people are smart and that's okay. I'm not saying you're good at volleyball. You know, you might not be. You might be bad at volleyball. <laughs> I don't know, but but some but some things are certain. People are some are certain things. You appear smart, right? Okay. To a, a re pretty regular person like myself, is it harder to be in love when you're smart? Like, because smart makes it so you kind of look at things a lot. You know. Um, so intelligent people uh, generally have a harder time, um, and the problem, and this is the work of Stanovich and others. The problem we've also gotten into is we've confused being intelligent with being rational, and we've confused being rational with being logical. And so we get all messed up about this. Intelligence is your capacity to solve problems. Rationality is ultimately, I would argue, and this is the ancient notion, this is Plato's notion. It's not about being logical. Rationality is about using your intelligence to become aware of the self-deception and the bias so that you can overcome it. That's what, so mindfulness is a way of being rational, even though you're not running any arguments in your head. Okay. So, so if, if you, and Plato, Plato was deep about reason in that sense, reason. We still carry it around when we talk about somebody being reasonable, right? Reason in that sense and love, they're interwoven because reason in that sense is the profound love and faithfulness to what is true, what is good and beautiful. And I think if you're intelligent, and you're not, and you haven't cultivated rationality and its accompanying virtues, then you are more and more tempted to problematize your relationship just because you have the intelligence machinery to, to uh. use. But if you could, so 
But if you can start making hurdles because your brain, that's what it's, it just, it likes to solve problems, so it'll just make problems. Right, and, and what your brain will also do, right, is your brain, so your brain is a, a, a powerful prediction machine. It's a relevance real life. Remember, we talked about anticipating the future. Mm -hmm. So your, your brain is constantly also science, trying to solve problems you didn't solve in the past. Uh, and so, you, it, so in a bit of a slogan, your brain actually prefers familiar unhappiness to unexpected happiness, because it likes organization, right? It likes it likes it likes familiarity because familiarity at least initially seems that you're predicting things. Now the problem with familiarity is, and you know this, you know you see you see this in your friends, and they see it in you, and the the, the great. The great gift is if you could come to see it in yourself. You're doing that thing, Bill. You're doing that thing you always do in your relationships. You're doing it again, yeah. right? And and you seem so wise from the outside, except you know, two years later, Bill comes to you and says, you know, Theo, you're, you're doing that. You're, thing. You're, you're doing that thing again, <laughs> right? right, right. <laughs> yeah. Now you're doing that thing, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. I so, know it's so, so interesting. So you you have to your intelligence not only is problematizing things by looking for problems, it's also trying to solve previous relationships, but in often in a maladaptive way. Mm -hmm. um, but if you can bring rationality in the platonic sense, rationality, love, virtue, into faithfulness, um, and they're all interdependent, if you can bring that in, then I think then it shifts and that actually makes gives you a greater capacity to enter deeply into a loving relationship. I, 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 I like, I want everybody to understand I'm, I'm like 61, almost 62, and I've like screwed up. Well, you a look young, man. Well, thank you. I've screwed up a lot, mm -hmm. um, and I continue, I continue to, to make sense. So, so um, uh, I want to give credit to a lot of the people that helped me along the way, and I want to give credit to my friends and also to my, my beloved partner. For, like, for anything I'm saying here, I, 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 I owe it profoundly to them. Yeah, and we're just trying our best, you know. It's that, like it doesn't mean that you know everything. No, and I don't want to come across that way, but I, I do want I but think I, so. But okay, good. But I also but I also feel your questions deserve a, a you know the best, most responsible answer I can give them. No, and I appreciate that. Yeah, that's what I'm hoping for. Um yeah, because I think that's a challenging thing these days. I mean, especially, you know, we've let so much cons like We've let so much, and I don't know if it's capitalism or what we let win in our country. We let those things become more important. Like, you know, we let like, uh, I mean, I use pornography as an example, just how it killed, it's killed a lot of the libido in the world. Yes. I feel like, and so there's no. It makes salient as opposed to offering depth. See, the, the, and Han talks about this in Saving Beauty. Um, he talks about how pornography Makes he talks about how we've we've trying to make everything smooth. We've instead of see if you read the ancients or even Rilke, beauty is almost terrifying because it shocks you, yeah. it wakes you up, it makes you oh I didn't realize the world could be like this. Oh, right? I remember I saw a hot chick, I couldn't even handle it, dude. Right, I right. Had to go, yeah, I but, tried to almost bury myself in the dirt one time because I couldn't handle it. The first time I saw a beautiful it, girl, it's overwhelmingly powerful. And you know, like course, eleven inches of dirt out and fucking sat in there. <laughs> Isn't that crazy though. But it well, I it's. It, it's, it's, it's something that we've done everything else to. We've tried to like. Uh, what did what did Rilke say? Beauty is uh, the angel that almost threatens to kill you, but doesn't. Mm. Right. And and then what what pornography does, according to Han, is it just makes everything. There's no challenge. And what that and we think that's great because now it's easily accessible. I can have it. But there's no confrontation with mystery. There's no calling to go beyond oneself. There's no calling to challenge one. So everything is now smooth for us. And right. we've, we've adopted an aesthetic of the smooth and the easy and the comfortable. I think you're right. Pornography is a, 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 you know, a clear symptom of just how, and then we, and, 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 and it's that hyperbolic discounting. We get the, 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 the momentary thing and we lose the long-term project yeah, the long-term project of relationship, yep, of yep. cultivating sexuality between yourself and a partner. Yes. It's like, okay, do I want to go out and meet someone and try to fall in love and try to covet them and respect them 
and create sensuality and make this long diatribe of a relationship that has value to both me and them? Or do I just want to go squeeze one out over here? Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. And a lot of times you'll just choose that easier one. You're, you'll just buy a new vape or something and choose that easier one instead of go that longer road where there's going to be more value. You know, and it's almost become so prevalent that some people don't even know that there is the longer road anymore. Uh, the fact that that's the scary part yeah, to me. Yeah, we bro we're growing up in a generation who has never been without screens, and and where pornography is available all the time, everywhere. And everything is, if you want to laugh, now this is kind of an interesting one, but if you want to laugh, you can go find you a laugh, you know? Yeah, you yeah. can find a laugh pretty quick. And and music but if you too. wanted to be out, like, we had to make each other, like, you had to you had to be the videos you're watching in a yeah. way. You had to yeah. use your imagination to iterate what had happened yes, before. Yes. Like, you had, you felt like a cog in the, in the in the wheel of um entertainment yeah. just by being a human being yeah. and some of that has disappeared you know um i mean conversation is people are listening to people have conversations that's how archaic they're becoming so, that people are listening to podcasts yeah. to hear people talk freely so one uh, uh, by the way the I loved seeing you that animated. That was really powerful. So thank you for sharing that with me. That was oh, thanks, man. That was really yeah. I didn't know it was going to be so powerful to me, but I think it does. I think I've felt fallen victim so much to pornography, especially in my twenties. That like, dude, it just makes me mad. You know, the time I didn't, wasted. Yeah, yeah, time wasted, and the ability to love wasted, and the ability to learn about love. You know. I didn't have any other choice, you know, but, um, I mean, I maybe had a choice, but I wasn't aware. Yeah. You know? Yeah, for sure. But, um, anyway, go on. Well, I was just going to say that, uh, one of the things that I'm trying to do with the going uh, with the podcast and the videos, but I'm also building in person things is build a bridge between those mm. so that when people see these, cause I get comments all the time. It's like, I wish I could be part of that, com those kind of conversation, that kind of dialogos. I use the Greek word. Yeah. Right. And then we say, well, you can, and here's a place you can come where you can start to practice it. Um, you know, and either we can do it through a Zoom room, and that still works, by the way, which is really fascinating because as a scientist, I wonder would it, would it work, but it still does. Uh, but we can also do it in person and trying to build that bridge so people can, once they see, I want to be part of that, I want to participate in that, like you were just talking about with so much so much life. There's a place they can go where they can. There's a bridge between witnessing and wanting to be in such a conversation and actually practicing and participating in it. Yeah. Yeah, well, there's also, there's, I mean, uh, there's 12-step programs for everything, which is great. And, you know, I go to some of the meetings for, they have like intimacy and love addiction. And some of the names of the groups are, are a little bit off sometimes, but yeah. you can go in there and listen to people talk about uh, their struggles with um, relationships yeah, yeah. and uh, sometimes pornography, all different types of stuff. I met a buddy that was a flasher in there. So you get yeah. all type. I mean, you yeah. know, some of it's kind yeah. of cool, kind of. Yeah. I mean, not cool, you know, but it is kind of neat. You know, yeah, yeah, you know yeah. a flasher, you never yeah, thought yeah, you'd yeah, know yeah. one. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know, yeah, and yeah you yeah, know yeah. him. Yeah. You know, that's great. And um, so, yeah, I think some of that's just the the rooms that are out there that people are sharing, like what their life is like and, and getting better and recovering from those things are pretty fascinating. Um, it's also at a time where it's like, yeah, if you're willing to share what's going on with you, there's a ton of value to that. Yeah, I mean, as long as it doesn't turn into that thing we were talking about earlier, like the reality oh, shows, yeah. where it just becomes something that we can modify in order to put another trophy of narcissism on our wall, right? And see how special I am? I can disclose more than you can. And that's why I think, that's why I, I really strongly challenge, don't, don't find. Don't think that there's one thing you can do that will be a panacea. You need a whole bunch of practices, all doing this checks and balance. You need to do it with a bunch of different people coming from different perspectives, right? And only then do you have the chance that it might not degenerate in that that fashion. Yeah, because I do worry that we uh, we're getting kind of like therapy porn starting to emerge in our culture where mm. what you know what I'm going to do is I, I'm going to just open up and share my feelings right and it's like toward what end are you cultivating virtue are you overcoming self deception are you helping the other person to grow like no it's just I'm going to expose myself 
So and that's you know right, and it's now like the flasher, is, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like I'm going to expose oh, myself, yeah. and, and 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 then what we'll do is oh, I got to see deeply into somebody, and it oh it was so smooth, it was so easy. It's a pornography. It doesn't take any commitment or challenge. I don't have to make myself responsible to that person. They'll just gush, and I'll just drink it in. And I'm worried that that's growing right now. Wow, it. that's fascinating, man. Yeah, because I worry about that sometimes, like not only in my own life, but. Yeah, you see stuff like that. I have some friends that are vloggers mm -hmm. and they vlog every minute of their lives yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. And you can see they start to get like they don't even remember what they're doing anymore. No. They're performing for yeah. constantly for an audience and they're, they start doing strange things yeah. and almost become trapped in this yeah. manic episode, you yeah. know? It's that reciprocal narrowing and that, right? And, and, and they're trying to have something instead of become someone. Like, yeah, yeah, and the fact that, the, I mean, that's another symptom of the meaning crisis. The fact, as you noted, this kind of stuff is spreading like a disease. Like, yeah. Right? Yeah. But there's always been diseases, right? There's always been things that have come along. We've always gotten through them. Well, yeah. I mean, sometimes we got through, it like, things like the Bronze Age collapse, you know, uh, 1177 BCE, right? We've had... Bronze Age civilizations, ancient Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, the Hittite Empire, the Mycenaean civilization. They all collapsed. All collapsed, all except for Egypt. Assyria almost collapses. It shrinks. Uh, Egypt survives because of one of my favorite people of history. I just got a book on him. Ramses III. He's, uh, he's a military genius, and he defeats the invading people, the sea peoples, in two great battles. And he's, he's, like, he's trying to hold up the whole Bronze Age world on his shoulders. Uh, uh, but uh, even Egypt, yeah, once he, he gets assassinated, and it, once he's gone, even Egypt goes in decline. So most of the civil, more, more cities went out of existence, more trade is lost, more literacy is lost than in any other time in the Western world. Even the fall of the Roman West, the Western Roman Empire was not as great as the Bronze Age collapse. Wow. So things can really collapse now. And then there's a, like there's several centuries. And you don't want to be alive in the centuries after the Bronze Age collapse. They're really, really bad time to be alive. Oh, it gets pretty sketchy. It huh? gets really bad. But it opens up possibilities and people start to experiment. They create new psychotechnologies, alphabetic literacy, numeracy, and that gives birth to the axial age to people like Socrates and Buddha and uh, Lao Tse. Yeah, it's almost like you just needed it over time. It's like that's the cycle. Yeah, there's some people who think that, 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 uh, that complex organizations go through what's called self-organizing criticality. They organize and they build and they get very complex and then they get they can't they get too top heavy like a like a pile of sand and then it avalanches and it all collapses. But that provides a, a broader base and then it can build again even higher than before. Yeah. And it oscillates in that way. Yeah, you know, some people have argued that. Human cognition seems to work in, in that way too. Yeah? Yeah. And so um you know what? You 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 can't solve this problem, and you 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 got a sense, but you can't. You're just framing it the wrong way, but you can't break out of the wrong frame. Um, and and what often has to happen is you have to break that frame. You have to like, and sometimes breaking it's really 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 hard. Sometimes it's easy. Like you'll do things like you'll say to people, you know, uh, what's the gray stuff that comes from fire? And they say smoke. And what's what am I doing with my hand right now? My arm? Oh, that's a stroke. Um, and what am I doing right now? Oh, oh, that's a choke. And what kind of tree grows from an acorn? That's an oak. And what do you call the white of an egg? And they'll say, oh, a yolk. Of course, it's not. It's the white of the egg, right? Mm. You, you fall into a frame and you get locked, right? And sometimes the frames are fairly easy. Sometimes the frames are really, really hard. Like you're, you're deep in modal confusion, right? And oh, yeah. Right. And so breaking that frame is like that, that avalanche. You have to break that frame. But if you if if you don't break it to the point of trauma, if you break it in the right way, what it does is it it allows the brain's capacity to self organize to reorganize from like a broader or different base. Got it. And then you get a new frame, and then you get that aha moment. And typically, what happens, at least that's a, a significant theory, is the activity is pre predominantly in the left hemisphere, which is your logical sort of step by step, fine grained, well defined problem side. And you realize, oh, I can't solve this problem, and it goes into the right hemisphere, which was for like predation. The party's at, yeah. well, well, it's predation. It's wide open attention. You, you're trying to get a, a, a wide picture, the big perspective. And what you do is you, you go over there, get a new bigger perspective, ah, and then bring it then back bring it in. Back. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's cool. Um, 
do you think sometimes like you know he, say if you put like you took a bunch of sand right and just poured it into this mm -hmm. this glass right here right this it would fill it up right yeah do you ever think that there's a lot more going on in the world but that us as a vet like a vessel only can comp can understand so much sure. so that there could be so much more happening out here but our ability to understand is only it's this glass Right, so th th I, 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 I would say I know that's the case because of what we rely on. Um, we, so most of our problem solving is not done as individuals. Uh, you didn't invent English, I didn't invent English. You're not m managing the electric grid, I'm not a manager, managing. You didn't invent these microphones, I didn't invent them, right? You didn't make these chairs, you didn't build this building, blah, 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 blah. Like, we forget that most of our problems, no one person can run an airline or a railroad, right? Right, yeah. right, right? And so what, what, what you can show, what you, actually what, what we seem to do it, I've done work on this with Dan Chiappi. We've investigated the, the scientists moving the rovers around on Mars. But what our, our primary ad adaptivity is we plug into that collective intelligence. And that collective intelligence can often grasp objects that we can't individually I grasp. see. So it could be bigger than this. Right. So like to give you a clear example, no one – and I'm not trying to get into political controversies right now. Uh, but like no one person can perceive or even measure or track global warming. It takes a whole bunch of scientists with a whole bunch of equipment all around yeah, the world. Yeah, totally. You can't just be a, some dude guessing. Right. And no one person – this is at H H Hutchins. Probably. No one person steer, navigates a ship. It's a bunch of people and a bunch of equipment and they navigate the ship, right? Yeah. And so – so we plug into right the the intelligence of civilization basically but the problem is there are things that can even exceed that because civilizations probably face what's called um general systems collapse what that means is so here's a civilization and it's it's dealing it's growing and what it's doing is it's solving problems and uh, every 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 time a new problem emerges it adds a it adds a new piece on itself, it, you know, and it grows and it grows and it grows and and initially it just it's good at growing and it's solving more and more problems. The problem is as it grows more and more and more. Think about a bureaucracy or a government bureaucracy. As it grows more and more and more, it starts to become as complicated as anything it's trying to solve in the world. Does mm. that make sense? Yeah. And eventually, it gets so big that it can't manage itself well enough to solve any unexpected new problems. And then you get general systems collapse. And it's so, making its own problems then. And too. it's making its own problems. And and, and and it starts to be and you can you can tell when an institution is cusping on that, um, and I think the universities are suffering this problem, is when the when 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 the like the bureaucracy starts to become for its own sake rather than for solving problems because mm. it, it's much more about managing and maintaining its own existence, right? And the civil services of some countries uh, go down that route too. So I think we have an individual limit and then we, we deal with that by plugging into the civilization, but the civilizations also have a threshold. Man, freaking existing, bro. It's complicated. Yeah. It's, well, and the thing is, it's complicated, but reality is actually complex. Uh, complicated is we, 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 we can manage all the variables, uh, but there, there's just a lot of them. Complex is we have real uncertainty and there, and there are new emergent variables and they're dynamically shifting their relationship to each other. Reality is actually complex and we create complicated systems within and without and between us to drill with that complexity, but at some point we get challenged. And part of what I think we need to face that was a, uh, a distinction from Snowden. Uh, part of what we need to f uh, f uh, do face, and I, uh, this is, comes out in my conversations with Jordan Hall and others, and this is something we're now discovering in biology. So you can evolve a trait, like uh, this creature's going to be faster or, right, or taller or something like that. But what we're now realizing, is, and this is, is it Owen Gilbert? Yeah, I always get the names the wrong way around, right? You can also evolve your evolvability which is you can you can evolve so you can evolve faster or better than other species. Really? So you can mate with someone who evolves well and make a hyper- Well, 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 well let, let's just, you just brought something up there. Okay, for mil, bil, billions of years, organisms are single-celled and they reproduce asexually. They just divide, right? Mm -hmm. Human beings reproduce sexually. 
Sexuality reshuffles the genetic deck so we get more variation. And with more variation, evolution speeds up. So one of the reasons sex becomes pervasive is it because it makes you more evolvable as a species. And now using that analogy, we have to learn to become, we not. We have to stop just, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, no, no, sorry, we don't have, to, we shouldn't stop, I'm gonna become stronger or braver traits. We have to keep doing that, but we have to do this higher order thing. We have to, we, we have to evolve our evolvability right now because the, the, the way things are complexifying is accelerating dramatically. Yeah. Well, especially in the U.S., I mean, it's like we've become, you know, it's a very, I mean, America's always been kind of a, a, it's always been like a diversifying landscape, you know? Very. I think a lot of people, I know it's been tough for my mother and for people of her generation because they had like this idea of America, right? Yes, yeah. And like of what it stood for and the things we fought for and the yeah. things that our brothers and sisters died for, you know, those, yeah, all yeah. of that. Yeah, yeah, And those things, a lot of those things now, people look at them and the, the news will scoff at those or things. Or sneer, yes. Yes, even sneer, not even take into account that some of these people died died or that their loved ones had to witness them die like yeah you know um and a lot of those people start to lose their uh hope you know yeah they become they they lose orientation right it's i mean like, lo completely lose orientation which yeah, is crazy yeah. like that's how much a uh, comfortable landscape or common the commonalities mean to people. See, the landscape doesn't have to be comfortable. They were willing to go to war. They were will. The, the, the landscape has to be navigatable, and navigation is not something you can do primarily on your own. Right? You have to do. You have to obviously move yourself around. Right. But you have to be oriented, and other people have to cooperate in the orientation with you, and you help each other, and that's how you navigate a landscape. And because of what you just said. We're losing another way of talking about the meaning crisis, uh, not being at home, domicile, is people are feeling increasingly disoriented. They don't know which way to go. Yeah. They don't know what they should be doing. And so what they do is they fall into things by default. And I'm not, I'm not criticizing anybody. No, right? no, this right? is normal. They, they it's fall for safety into mechanism. I just keep on keeping on and I just do what I've been doing. That's where I think a lot of people are right now. Yeah. You know, not only older folks, but younger folks as well. Um, they're just wondering what I used to think I was part of something. Now I don't feel like that anymore. Looking out for just myself feels, doesn't feel good. Well, it's very small. Yeah. Right? It's very, very small. Yeah. It feels really small. I mean, I think there's moments of it where it's, it's it's nice in a way where you're like, oh, I'm going to have some self-confidence. Yeah, yeah, gonna, of course. I'm going to achieve. You have to have self-care. Yeah. Man, it feels very lonely. Yeah. You know, and I think a lot of people are are kind of wondering that. So I wonder if that will lead people back to mm, religion, looking for purpose. And I wonder why in America we've gone to like Canadians. I mean, you're Canadian, <laughs> yeah. You I know, am. and thank you for being Canadian. I like them. Well, uh, John Oliver is right about Canada, right? I don't like John Oliver uh, like a lot, but when he said that, you know. Uh, it's if, as if the United States and Great Britain had a child that they abandoned in the snow, yeah. right? Right. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, we, I mean, we lived under a superpower, Great Britain, and we slowly negotiated our way out. We didn't have a revolution. We slowly negotiated. We don't have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We have peace, order, good government. That's our, that's our constitution. We slowly negotiated our way out, Right. And you can't point to a point in history and say, that's when Canada was completely not a colony anymore. It's there, maybe the Statute of Westminster in 1931, but like it's a gradual thing, right? And, and, and as we slowly did that, the superpower emerged to the south of us that went on to conquer the world. I mean, the, America is a titanic entity. I mean, like the Second World War, they take on the Japanese Empire almost single-handedly while manning most of the Western Front, and it, like it's Titanic, it's huge, yeah. and they're, and they're just overwhelming, and they continue to be so. Like even militarily, you know, you you take all of the other NATO countries and pit them against the American military. The American military will destroy them in three days. Like America is like like, and Canada is like. 
We like imagine this. There was a superpower, and we slowly managed to get out of a shadow. We very carefully negotiate, yeah. only to have this other one emerge, right? That overshadows us <laughs> uh, powerfully and com and completely. So we're always we're always in between. We've always been in between, and we're always much more about because we don't we can't enforce our way on the world. We're more much more about perspective. And negotiating, we negotiate with mm. we negotiated with Great Britain, and we negotiate with the United States. And thankfully, both Great Britain and the United States are willing and have been have been uh, willing to negotiate with us and to ally with us. Yeah, and you're willing, and you get you get to be right there. Net, you you kind of have to have a. Canada's always been a very peaceful place. I feel like a lot of my friends there are yeah. good listeners. Yes, um, you know, I think people are like with like. I'm surprised there's not a max a mass exodus to Canada, um, but great posture too. I don't know if you've ever seen the posture in Toronto, <laughs> yeah. have you seen it? Well, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, part of it is because you can't slouch in winter when you're wearing ten thousand layers of That's clothing. That's a good point, huh? Right, right. You gotta you gotta bear yourself well. Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, and they do it. You can yeah. barely people just you can barely see them. They're so straight sometimes. Yeah. Just like watching something go by. Um, but yeah, I find that uh. That it's interesting that we're finding like guys like you, Jordan Peterson, um, and you guys work together. We were colleagues. Jordan was just down the hallway from me. Uh, we continue uh, to keep in communication because uh, he doesn't teach anymore now, does he? No, I mean he had a very he had a very fraught relationship with the university. Oh, he Toronto. did. Yeah, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, um, and I think there was fault on both sides in that issue. Um, uh, I mean, uh, but I want to be very clear. I have a really good relationship uh, with the University of Toronto. They've treated me, uh, well, the, the psychology department at least, has treated me extremely, extremely well. This yeah. Time, right? Uh, but J Jordan and I were, were colleagues. Uh, we were very friendly colleagues. Uh, we shared students. Uh, we we were we would frequently find ourselves at the same conference at the same conference talking about stuff. That's fun. Was it fun to discuss things with him and be able to communicate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I want to say this very carefully because whatever you say about Jordan Peterson, it, it'll bite you in the ass no matter what you say. Uh, is Jordan Jordan's a very divisive person, but um, Jordan. And it's reciprocated. Jordan respects me. And when Jordan respects you, he interacts with you differently than if he doesn't respect you or he doesn't know if he should respect you. Mm. Then he interacts. That, that This is at least to my mind. It could be a safety mechanism too. It could be a safety mechanism. It could also be that uh, that's the kind of teacher he was. Very careful. There were three life-changing professors at the University of Toronto. Uh, one, I won't mention his name. Um, and the other two were myself and Jordan Peterson. And, um, and so we often, uh, shared students. Um, like I said, I've always had, I've always had, and I've appreciated very good relationships with Jordan. I don't agree with Jordan on certain things, especially political things. Um, but you see, like when, when when some of the stuff dropped initially, I would send, I'd send him an email and I'd say, here's my arguments against your position. Um, but I think they should treat you with respect. You're making a point and you should be tr treated with like the way uh, he shouldn't have just been sneered at or yelled at. They should have like, they should have, they should, he deserved to be given an, a, a good hearing, a good counter argument. Yeah. I think once you get, once you get to a certain level kind of a popularity and once you're in the social media sphere in, in some sense, you don't it becomes more of like a, a Mad Max beyond Thunderdome out there and not as much of a, probably the grounds you guys are used to where people communicate yeah, regularly. Yeah, and so the thing is, like when I would write him that email, uh, he would say thank you. Like he, he was appreciative or like, you know, I'll, I'll be on his, uh, you know, channel with him and he'll, he'll, you know, he'll criticize postmodernism and I'll say, well, I think there's value to postmodernism and here's the value and here's like, you know, Foucault was saying this and, you, you know, and Derrida was saying, uh, and, and, you know, and, and he'll be responsive and respect, respectful. Yeah. Uh, right. And so, but, uh, but the, 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 the thing about that is, is like, it's, it, it, I want to maintain a good relationship with like when he somehow he found out I had diabetes and he sent me a, like a supportive email and I appreciate that like I, I I believe 
and this will get me in hot water with some people, but I believe that Jordan is fundamentally a good person, and I think he has very good intent, and I think he's terrifically talented. Um, but, um, well, the things that make you adaptive make you prone to self-deception, and there's things that he also, uh, we fundamentally don't agree on. Yeah. But, but right, I think if people, if we could get out of the polarization around him, and to be fair, I think he contributes to it. I don't. He's. I think by his own admission, he's not very good on Twitter. Right? Yeah. Right. 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. right. No, uh, I think he would admit that. I'm but, trying but, to think of what we talked about when I was with when I chatted with him. If we if we could get out of polarizing, and if he could get out of being caught up in that, like what's really impressive is that like like when I've talked to him or John and Jonathan and Pajot and I talked to him, he'll get a lot of comments like, "Do more of those, Jordan. Do more of those." Yeah. Right. Because for me, I feel like that's the Jordan that I really respect and I have affection for coming to the fore. And then there's this other aspect of him that I I can't. I, I can't connect to him. Uh, yeah, so, maybe he likes to get into the fracas of it, you know? Well, see, we, we, there, there, that's a philosophical difference between us. I think trying to solve the meaning crisis at the adversarial level of propositional just ideas and ideologies and that kind, I don't think it can be solved there. We've been talking about a much different level, a much different ways in which the meaning crisis has to be solved. I think... I, I'm, I, I, and I don't, this isn't a, this isn't a scapegoat. I did, this costs me. So this isn't, this doesn't come for free. This isn't a cop out. I'm metapolitical. I think that trying to get engaged with this problem in a political framing is fundamentally a modal confusion. It is to make that kind of profound mistake. I think the left at its best reminds us that we're finite animals subject to fate and we have to show compassion to each other. And the right at its best reminds us that we're also called to transcendence and the cultivation of virtue. And when they worked where they were correcting each other and helping each other doing, emerge doing and were committed to democracy, then we have something wonderful. When they break that up into winner take all, the other side is evil and I have to destroy them, then that society, that democracy is doomed and over. And I think that's where our political situation is. So I refuse, like Socrates, I refuse, and Plato, I refuse to participate in the political yeah. domain because for me, I do not, and see, Jordan wants to go in there guns blazing, and that's a fundamental difference between us. And so we've come to understand that we won't talk about those things. Right. right. Those are just ways you guys are. Yeah. And I'm glad we probably need people to be both ways. I think I think some of the online stuff gets like, um, it gets uh, addictive probably, you yeah. know? It is. Yeah. I think once you get into that world, there's people that their whole lives are that world, it, it, you know? It, 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 and he loves to argue points. So I think uh, if you want to argue stuff, yeah, yeah. you can do it all day there. Well, you it, know? Yeah. But it's argument, it's, it's argument for, so, f, f, uh, Plato made a distinction between philosophia, the love of wisdom, and philo Nikea, the love of victory. Mm. And when it's the love of victory, then you've lost the Socratic spirit. Right. Right. Like, like I will disagree with people. Uh, Bishop Maximus and I, we disagree. He's he is a committed, and I think profound and virtuous Christian. I'm not. We know this, and yet, and uh, but so we disagree in profound. And yet, he's one of my dearest friends, and we draw each other out, and we contribute to each other. Right? You can disagree, you can argue, you can challenge, but you don't have to pursue demonization, destruction. You don't have to pursue confirmation porn. You don't have to pursue narrative porn. You know what the narrative bias is? Narrative is, I, I this is a real bias. I can tell a story about that, so it must mean I know what's going on, mm. right? And so we get simplistic narratives, we get confirmation porn, we get this, we get this sort of self, this self righteous adversarial. I'm going to destroy the other, and I'll and see. It shows how good I, and it's ultimately narcissistic. I I don't want to participate in any of that crap, right? Right, uh, and and. and so you can see I'm getting very animated. Oh, it's okay. It's I, interesting. I, I, I feel I feel I feel very strongly that. So, sorry, I I want to make it clear that I'm not arguing against Jordan in his absence. He I would welcome if he was here and could defend his position. Yeah, yeah. I don't think that we are. I think I have a decent enough relationship with, him, and I'm sure you have a great relationship with. Him, so I it's like good. 
I would understand if he, he wouldn't be upset. I don't. Think. I don't think so. I think he. I think he understands that we're like. Yeah. He he he's invited me to do things like to. Uh, he's putting together a new course, Peterson Academy, and I've taught a. I've 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 already done one course for him on intelligence, rationality, wisdom, and spirituality. Uh, but when he when he came to when he made the offer to me, he said, "Well, I said Jordan, I'm not a conservative. I'm not a Christian." And I have ideas other than yours. He said, first of all, you can criticize me if you want. You have complete academic freedom. And you don't have to be a Christian, and you don't have to toe the conservative line. I just want you to come in and give the best possible course you could give. And I said, okay, under those conditions, I'll do it. Because why wouldn't I? That's a completely virtuous context. Yeah. And I hate guilt by associating. Well, you're associating with it. You, 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 really? Yeah, that's uh, become a huge problem in, America, well, the, 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 in politics overall and well, in, uh, in society. You, 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 you can't do that. You're right. You, you like, like it, it's so funny. Like people don't even realize. Like they'll guilt by association, and then they'll they'll espouse sort of Foucault and postmodernism, who are deeply influenced, profoundly influenced by Heidegger, who was literally a Nazi, <laughs> right? And it's like, what, what, what? Where does your guilt by? How does your guilt by association metric work? Right? It doesn't work consistently. It doesn't work coherently. Um, and, you know, I think that it's important that we give people a chance to enter into genuine dialogos with us, that we don't, you know, part of understanding forgiveness, which is an important part of agape, that's Jesus of Nazareth, if forgiveness isn't like mercy, I, I, I let you off the hook, forgiveness is I'm giving you the chance to enter into a relationship with me and even giving myself to enter in a chance into a relationship with you before it has been earned. Because something has happened that I can't earn it until, like I'm in a catch-22, unless you give me the chance to enter into the relationship, mm. I can't do the things that will allow me to re-earn your trust. Right. And so you need to give me that Right? You need to forgive. Well, I'm playing with the word a little bit, right? You, you need to forgive and, and and make the so that we're not bound in reciprocal narrowing. So there's a chance for reciprocal opening. I think we've lost we've lost the commitment to that. We've America used to. I mean, I'm a Canadian. And I only get it through the media, popular media. But America used to be a place, at least it seemed to me where people were initially given the benefit of the doubt because you were all Americans and you all believed in democracy. As far as I can tell now, I mean, there's research to show this. You know, Republicans are more afraid of Democrats than they are of China and and vice versa, yeah. right? And, and nobody believes in democracy anymore. Everybody's convinced mm. on both sides this, like, the, I'm in this to win, not to make America better, right? And, and so, I mean, I, That's I, a I great hesitate. point. But, well, I'm, uh, you're an American, and I'm glad you're nodding to that because I feel a little bit weird here commenting. No, well, I, mean, I think that's a great point. I hadn't really thought about that. Everybody's in it to win. They're not in it for how do we get out of this? How do we get to a better place? How can we all get to a place together that we could not possibly get to on our own? That was the proposal of democracy. Yeah. The proposal of democracy is we will all engage in self-deception, but we—, we it, but if you have a different point of view and I'm willing to enter into genuine dialogos with you, you can help me correct mine and I can help you correct yours. Yeah. And we can get to a place together that we couldn't get to on our own. That is the great promise of democracy. It's also the great promise of science. John Dewey, one of your great philosophers, said those two, when they're both working, they work together profoundly. That's mm. what America was. Well, at least to my mind. Yeah. And did he do the Dewey Decimal System? Yes, that's that John Dewey. I knew it, dude. I knew he freaking did it. God, I can't believe some weirdo would do that, but I'm grateful he did it. Yeah, me too. Because I needed to get those books. <laughs> um, I don't know if you saw this, John. It says the moon is open for business. Entrepreneurs are racing to make billions. That they're gonna basically they're planning on opening the moon where people can go there and have like a little colony. Hmm. That that's like as if the moon's gonna become the new like you know, we're heading, we're the Mayflower, you know? Yeah, well, I mean, there, there, that, that, that's, I mean, that's part of what's happened to the American mythos, right? Um, is the, 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 the frontier, the new world, the frontier. When it's gone now, I mean, there's nowhere left to go. Right, and, and we try, and Star Trek tried to propose that space would be the final frontier, and we're still playing with that. But the problem is space isn't the same way as another continent, right? Um, and yeah, I think, 
uh, uh, America is. I hadn't thought about this. Sorry, I'm, this is just coming to me. No, it's okay. It's just the news. It says, yeah. uh, uh, with its Artemis missions, the U.S. Space Agency aims to lay the foundations for the first human settlements beyond yeah. Earth and pave the way for extraplanetary colonization uh, and that business is at the core of its strategy. So I, I've wondered about this, uh, I, uh, that it, uh, maybe there's a hunger in America for another frontier. Uh, I could see that. Yeah. And maybe trying to make that happen. I, I yeah, they. There's been some historians who talked about that and how the frontier kept moving until they hit sort of the Pacific Ocean, and then there was a problem because <laughs> this is oversimplistic. But generally, what happened is people who were relatively more stable and mm -hmm. were m more sociable stayed and people that were a little bit fringe would yeah. move to the frontier and then they kept moving and they kept moving and then they end up in California kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Australia. Uh, uh, right, right, yeah, or Australia, right? And then the problem is, right, that we lost we we lost that or, or the United States, the Canada didn't grow up that way. But the United States lost that ability, it lost that vision. Yeah, maybe that Maybe maybe there's even like a, a bit of a spiritual dimension uh, to this. There's, there's a, a, a try to attempt to get a sense of uh, well, we there's a frontier we can open up, uh, we can orient towards. I hadn't. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it just makes me wonder, like, you know, what if it's just a money thing so that rich people could look cool and take pictures on the moon. Like what big vow? I mean, I guess you could open up maybe a nice restaurant there that only really rich people could go to. Yeah, I mean, if it if it's just a business thing, and all we're doing is sort of flinging phalluses into the sky, like we've been doing recently. Um, yeah, that's just having, that's just modal confusion. It's just trying like, like sort of trying to have sort of have sex with the universe. Yeah, that's yeah. what it feels like to me. Yeah. Like a little bit of like a weird kind of like let's inflict ourselves onto I, the I world because we can afford it. One of the rockets even looked like a penis. It was really embarrassing. Really? Like, somebody with psychological training, I'm looking at this and going, like, that's a penis. Yeah. Like, and, you, and you're thrusting it into the sky, right? And it's like, uh, it's really weird. Uh, so yeah, you're right. It could become that. But, you know, if it becomes, if it becomes Plymouth, right? If it, become, if it becomes a stepping stone to maybe opening up colonization of other planets, then that could become something other. I don't know. There it is right there. Blue origin. There you go. See what I mean? Yeah, that thing. <laughs> Somebody's just slanging a wiener out into space, homie. Well, it's, it's you know, my, my dick's bigger than yours kind of oh. thing. Yes, yeah. Who doesn't want to just rip their wiener off and just hum it into the damn ether? <laughs> you know? Um, I remember at one point I hated my penis for some reason. Really? And I remember I wanted to cut it off and mail it to Africa, to like a starving country, and they could use it for a food. Isn't that crazy to think that? Um, uh, well, maybe, uh, but uh, I mean, a lot of people get into um, very ambivalent relationships to their uh, sexuality and to, you know, uh, their genitals. Um, Has that happened over time, you think, a lot of folks? I think it's always. I think it's a perennial thing about human beings. I think human beings, right? Sex, sex pulls us in the two directions. Sex pulls us towards the animal, the finite. We're having sex because we're finite. We're limited. We're trying to make more kids, mm -hmm. right? But sex can also call us. And you, you talked about this. There's a possibility of ecstasy. There's a possibility, like, and you have like tantra, which is, right? It, it, people understanding that. Sex is a powerful way to reciprocally open with another human being, and if you frame it the right way, you can go into ecstasy. You can go into self transcendence. You can you can you can touch aspects of your psyche that are otherwise inaccessible. And so, we've always understood, I think, that sex is a powerful thing, and it's 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 got this tension in it and one of the ways we try to just alleviate that tension is just well i'm just going to collapse to one side or the other we'll we'll just right we'll just yeah. do the one or we'll just do the other and again it's it's plato to my mind like the toughest thing for me to be to do loving wisely insofar as i have is to hold those two together about my sexuality right is to acknowledge 
the animal part, but don't identify with it, and to acknowledge the ecstatic part, but don't think I'm a god and identify with it, but try and keep the two talking to each other all the time. Mm. Yeah, I think I had just gotten so disappointed. Like, I think, because in my 20s, I was looking at pornography a lot, you know? Yeah, yeah, I would yeah. Choose that. Oh, I could see that, yeah. Over yeah. going on a date or something. Like, because yeah. it was less uh, committal. It was yeah. way less scary than, like, yeah. possibly disappointing a woman or possibly getting into a relationship, yeah. even. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, even if I had appeased a woman and then we, it, things got closer, that was very scary. And I remember, yeah, at one point I was just so sick of myself. I was like, I will just just mail my penis. And I guess I thought Africa, because it was like a starving country or something, well, they could use it as like a soup, meat or whatever. But just to put you in some uh, august company, you know, uh, you know, uh, St. Paul talked about cutting off your left hand, and Jesus did too, if, if it offends you, right? We can... We can misidentify with our body or parts of our, our body in a way like you just described and thank you for sharing that that can really narrow us down reciprocally bind us get us locked in and we can feel trapped and we feel like the only way out remember eric Fromm, is to destroy wow the, is to destroy right um now hope, yeah I, I i'm glad i'm glad you're not there and i'm i'm really glad you're you got out of that without having to damage yourself yeah me too I think there were just times where I was like, I'm going to fucking hum this thing over the fence. Yeah. You know, just because you just wanted to get rid of it. It felt like the cause of your Oh, of I, re your I remember saying pain. something, not quite as self-mutilating as that, but I remember saying for the longest time, if there was a button I could push and it would turn off my sexuality and leave everything else in place, I'd push that button. Oh, yeah. I won't push that button now. Yeah. I won't push that button now. It's different. And that's, again, the gift that has been given to me uh, by other people, especially... By my, my 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 this wonderful woman that I'm with, um, and so, yeah, uh, I I can understand that. I can understand how you can get to that place. But I think you know the rocket is also just a projected version of that. Oh, too. it's like us oh, just trying to show off. Yeah, and it seems like rich people are doing a lot of their own space. It's like everything has become very privatized. That's one thing that kind of scares me. Well, you know? yeah, and then we're losing we're losing the we. We're losing, you know, what can we do together and get to a place that we, we couldn't get on our own? And, and, you know, flinging the phallus into the sky is a way of saying, I can get there on my own. And the problem is, I bet you can, but so what, right? The the, the price you pay for that is uh, you, you haven't brought everyone else along. And then once you get there, you've lost that capacity that only civilization has. Yeah, you're there by yourself. You're there by yourself and, 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 you, and you lose all of, all, all of what, all, all the often frustrating, but also the wonderful ways in which human beings challenge us beyond ourselves, other human beings. Yeah. Yeah. It's like even, um, yeah, it's like even like the Olympics and stuff. Everybody's like, it takes different sides and points of views. It used to just be, we, you cheered for your team. You know, I wonder if it's like that in other countries or if it's just America doing all this bullshit. Well, I mean, the, the problem was the, 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 the Olympics also, I mean, they, they got corrupted by politics, right? I mean, it's even back, you know, 36 Olympics and they're in Berlin and Hitler's, the, the Nazis are running the Olympics, oh. right? And then you, and then you got, the, the Olympics got corrupted by the Cold War, um, right? And, and so they've always been pretty fallible to uh, somebody taking them out, like... Yeah, I mean, whenever whenever there's an arena in which human excellence could come to the fore, there are also people who want to grab the shiny thing and bullshit you with it and manipulate you around it. Um, that's always uh, that's always going to be the case, um, and that's a perennial problem. And so, again, the the answer to that is not let's win that game. To my mind, the answer is let's stop playing that game together. Mm. Yeah, it seems like that's a thing that's really been, that's gotten rough in America is, I mean, for one, our news, the faith in our news dissolved. Yeah, right? the legacy media has no legitimacy. And anymore. I mean, it happened like that, I felt like. Maybe yeah. I'm wrong, but it felt like it happened. Well, the, ca the cable news, like you said a long time ago, the cable fragmented the networks, right? And so when you don't have a consensus out there, when you don't have a listening consensus, that doesn't get reflected back as a, a consensus authority figure. When you're Walter Cronkite and so many people are listening to you, 
they, right, and they're all sharing that together, a lot of trust gets placed in you by a lot of people. Mm. When you're on some little cable thing, right, then that, that's 24 hours a day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then it, it, so, you know, CNN changed thing. I remember when I was watching CNN when it first came on and I got like a shiver went through me. I was watching it and I realized, the journalists are interviewing each other. I grew up in journalism when the journalists went to where the story was and interviewed the people that the story was happening to. And I'm watching CNN and it's, they're talking to each other. Yeah. And I go, oh no, this, this, is re this is really bad. This is, this is gonna isolate itself more and more and more and become more and more about itself very, very rapidly kind yeah. of thing. And it has, I used to watch CNN. I thought it was like the place I would go for news. And then like, I think five years ago or something, I just, I was like, I don't, this just isn't news anymore. I don't know. But the news lost itself. And so then conspiracy theories grew. They fill the vacuum. Because of course, people are trying to figure out the reality of news. They're yeah. trying to figure out real information. So I guess people are searching for real information. You know, they're trying to figure it out. Well, what the conspirituality shows you though, at least I would argue this, is they're not just searching for information for facts. They're, they're searching for meaning. They're searching for belonging. They're searching for connection. Like Socrates, they don't want just empty truths. They want transformative truths. Mm. And that's what, like if, like, like, like if you watch like a QAnon meeting, you know, yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll be the conspiracy language, but it looks like a church service. They're, they have like, there's songs and then there's somebody gives like a sermon and then they're supporting each other and they're offering childcare. And it's like, and, and you, like, it's like, like I'm not condoning anything here, but it's like, as a scientist, I look at that and I go, you know, they're they're creating a new religion. Yeah. And because what people want is they don't just want the facts, right? They want the facts that connect them to themselves, to each other, to the world, and to mm. what's ultimate. In a lot of cultures or in a lot of like, you know, America's become extremely diverse. You know, you have a lot of diversity issues like in France right now, like where- yeah. Canada too. Yeah. Yeah. Is it- is that just a phase that we go through as places diversify, like schools of thought changing? Like, are, are we eroding sometimes or are we evolving, do you feel like? That's where I sometimes wonder, like, you know, is diversification, is it too soon in some of these places? Is it, yeah. not is it right or is it wrong because it is it is what it is, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, but it, what is the byproducts of that in because some of it seems to be kind of scary in some spots, you know? Yeah, I mean, uh, the... And it may be too big of a fish to fry, you know? Well, I mean, calm community, common unity. Um, the The problem we're facing is we've, uh, I think for a good reason, we've decided, we've, we've realized that we've marginalized groups of people unfairly. We've disenfranchised them. They haven't been included. They have valuable things to say. Uh, 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 Somebody I'm, I'm recording some episodes with, uh, Greg Thomas. He's been he's a uh, he's a black man, and he's been teaching me how much jazz and the blues contributed to American culture, to American democracy. It's mm. been really that series is going to come out eventually. This has been yeah, we just went to Graceland the other day. So yeah, and so right, and and, and he talks about being an omni American and, and being a radical moderate, or like and talking about uh, a cultural worldview rather than a racialized worldview. Um, and you know, I, 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 I applaud his courage cause it, you know, it's difficult to make these things and, uh, make these kinds of statements. But I, I think what he's putting his finger on is yet yeah, we, we have to do this thing. We, we, we have to stop hurting people just because of who they are. And I firmly ag agree with that, but we haven't been, we haven't been, remember the ecology of practices. We haven't been counterbalancing that with, okay, good, let's do that. But what we need to do is we need to balance that with what are we doing to strengthen community. This is called complexification. So let me let me give you a, a biological example of this. Mm -hmm. we, you and I started out as a zygote, a fertilized egg. Mm -hmm. Initially, the egg just the cells just reproduce. But you know, then then they they start to do something. They start to differentiate. They start to become skin cells and lung scales, cells and hearts. Oh wow! So, right differentiation. Do they fight a little or not? No, well, here's the thing, but that's the thing. While they are di di differentiating, they are simultaneously, literally self-organ, self-organizing. They're also or organizing into organs. And so a, a living thing is simultaneously differentiating 
and integrating. Right. And, and when I am some, look at my hand. My hand is very differentiated, but it's also integrated. And when it when and, and when it does both of those, it complexifies. It gets emergent abilities, emergent powers. And if you only integrate, you get stultifying stillness. And if you only diversify, you get frustrating fragmentation. You need to have them properly integrated. Right, so that you get complexification. Mm. I think we should be. I'm not saying we should stop pursuing the diversification that we're doing. There are good moral arguments for doing this, and there's even good cultural arguments, right? But what we actually should be pursuing is complexification of our culture, which means we should also be countering balancing that with yes, but what binds us together and simple liberal tolerance doesn't do it it's not enough it's thin soup and we've lost we've lost the civic religions we've lost the sacred religions we've even lost a shared popular culture and just being t- taught you know well let's just all be nice to, that's not that, that it's that's not realistic it's not enough it's not you, enough you need a shared vision again I want everybody to hear what I'm saying. Pursue the diversification. This oh, is I hear it totally. That's right. But it also needs to be counterbalanced with also pursue the integration so that we complexify, so that we literally grow and have emergent abilities to deal with the problems that we're all collectively sharing. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, you know, I'm a my father's from Nicaragua, but I'm mostly viewed as just a white guy, you know. Um but it's been like it definitely feels like they've made just why a lot of times the media, it feels like, I'm not saying this is real, right? but it feels like, and I have friends that feel like that the, that like white Christian men are just made to be like the enemy, you know, and that yes. they've never done anything good. Demonizing and people will, will always end up. It's bad. been horrible it's because there's so many good people that now start to say, okay, you want to make me the enemy? Then that's what I'll be. You, It's almost like, not that's what I'll be, but then I'm going to separate myself from this society because I'm not even respected in it. Yeah, my Does son, that make any sense? Yeah, it makes direct sense to me as a father. Um, my son was in a program in which he, f- he would come home and he would feel dejected because he was demonized that way. And at one point he said, well, you know what? And this is the effect this had on him. I'm going to join the right because at least they'll work on my behalf and they'll stop demonizing it. And I had to sit him down. I said, son, don't do that. Like you're giving in to like you, the shadow side of what's happening to you is coming out. But I, I like, I had empathy. Like, it, it, like if you're demonizing somebody, do, do, do we really, like, do we really think that, oh, you've made me feel really horrible and guilty about myself for like all a long time. I, I'm just going to join your cause. No, some people will do that because they'll give in. But a lot of people are going to give that the finger, and they're going to fight back. Yeah, because, because like, like you you can't do that with people. So we again, we've got to get the balance. How can we take responsibility for what has happened without just transferring the group that we're going to hate, right? And and, and this is a really tricky problem. And, and, and yeah, it's and, very complex. It's it, it's very hard, and um. Uh, like I applaud people like uh, Greg. I'm mostly on this issue. I feel that I'm uh, I, I don't have the requisite education or expertise, and I also feel that you know I, I'm not the right person to. So I'm trying to really, really listen to people who I think do have the proper place and role to try and wrestle with this and learn from them as best I can. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think that's always a good idea, you know. I mean, it's just it's it's just it's nice to think about and talk about, you know. It's like we, we should. it's nice to be able to share that thought and and uh, just have it be discussed or heard or whatever, you know. Uh, and, and I think we should. I don't think I think I I think making things uh, topics that we can't discuss that we need to discuss is really problematizing things for a lot of people. Their problems don't go away by talking about them as if they don't exist. Right. Yeah, and you create you create people that are have fe- then you get people into fear. I uh, so I I know an increasing number of people who are you, I can see that the fires of resentment are building in them. Yeah, and it, it's dangerous. It's like this is like the, what like the Weimar Republic, 
right? The Versailles Treaty will crush the enemy into the dust because they're demons. And you just you end up breeding a demon that's 10 times worse. Um, and so I like I hope that we can get to a place where we can do that. We can do the kind of thing that you and I are trying to do here where we can do this like, you know, th th this dialogos conversation where we wrestle with things um, and, and we do it honestly and, and people are allowed to make mistakes without immediately being condemned. Like people are so afraid to make a mistake. You can't learn if you can't make mistakes. Like people have to be able to make mistakes and say, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize like, oh yeah, maybe that was a racist thing. I didn't know, right? I really honestly didn't know. Can you accept that I didn't know? And then can you help me? Like, right. But if we get to a place where you can't make mistakes, then you can't learn. And like it feels in a lot of places, people are walking on eggshells and everybody's terrified about making a mistake. And then everything gets this chilly, superficial kind of conversation. And then, and then we can't solve any of these problems. Well, I think it's kind of where Hollywood has kind of pigeonholed itself with some of its uh, creations these and days. And they're paying the price. I yeah. mean, so they're, they're claiming that this is what everybody believes. And then the box office is repeatedly telling them, no, they don't. And they resent it. And they're not listening. Well, it's almost like they have like, st like they're trying to create Stockholm syndrome with, uh, with their audiences, you know, not the, not that they need to be one way or the other, but just that, can we have some reality? Because what gets to be scary is as a regular person, you start to question your own fucking reality. You're like, am I, there's no way that I'm insane suddenly, you know? What we should go back to make making great stories that are great myth that afford people being imaginal. Yeah. That, that call them to wisdom and virtue. And then within that, ask them to consider issues of race and gender and economic status rather than hitting people over the head with uh, condemning messages or very superficial representation so that people watch this and they say, this is boring or I'm tired of getting preached at. Like again, like and here's a here's a, like right here. There's a point I want to make. We should be able to criticize the method without automatically being uh, 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 told that we are criticizing the goal. Mm. I think this is a goal. I, uh, should we reduce racism and racial tension? Should we make things more fair between like the sexes and the genders? Yes. And because I really believe that, I think there are there are good and bad ways of doing that. And we should be able to work together, and I could be wrong, and you could be wrong, and we should be able to criticize the methods if we actually believed in the goal. If we didn't believe, if we actually believe in the goal, if we actually believe in helping the people, we should be able to criticize the methods like science does. In, in order, in, 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 right? Instead of like, right, I'm, no, actually, I just want to plant my flag. Right. 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 And, and so, like, it's, no, it's a it's a great point. We should be able to criticize the methods without saying we're criticizing the goal. Yes, and it's gotten to the point now where you can't even raise your hand and ask a question without being lambasted so much in society or online that it gets uh, debilitating to to any real conversation. You know? Yeah, and, and again, I, I I would I would say that I think I can honestly say that I would say that equally to the left and the right. Let me criticize the methods. And it doesn't mean I'm necessarily criticizing the goal. I agree with the left. Your goals of making the world more compassionate, not making people the victims of fate, the fate of race or the fate of the economic class. That, yeah, they right, keep doing that. Right, keep doing that. But also I, I get well, the- Well, they keep doing that over and it's like, come on, we've heard this story a million times. Well, but-, but When are people going to start to live a new truth unless you start to tell them a new story? But that's it. The the It's like- that should never stop because that's a perennial thing. Human beings are all, but you have to have the method that doesn't dull people to it. And I also want to say this to the right. You're supposed to be calling people to personal responsibility and virtue. Are your leaders exemplars of virtue and personal responsibility? They don't seem to be, right? Yeah. I agree with your goals. Are your methods, like, you know how you convince people to pursue virtue? Be as virtuous as you can. Exemplify it. Be like Socrates. Be like Siddhartha. Be like Jesus. Right? 
Yeah. Uh, so, so I'm sorry. I'm, I'm probably pissing everybody off because I'm criticizing both the left and the right. No, I don't think. Look, I think those are challenges that everybody faces, you know. And when your back's against the wall or you feel like your back is against the wall, whoever that may be, you're going to uh, you're going to retaliate more than you are um, like uh, entertain. Yes, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. You know, so I think and a lot of people are feeling that way. It's interesting how so many groups at the same time can feel that way. That's what's kind of interesting to me. They can have opposite beliefs and be almost exactly in their behavior. And that is, uh, like, as a, as a psychologist, as a cognitive scientist, I, I like I, that is, I'm sorry, this sounds arrogant. I don't mean it to be, but it's so apparent to me. It's like, you're both acting the exact same way. And, the, and both sides will like, oh, no, we're not, we're not, we're not, yeah. right? they're yelling right now at me. But it's like, you 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 you're saying opposite. I hear you saying and shouting opposite things, but you seem to be acting in this almost the exact same way, uh, and um, and so that for me that's 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 a sign that like, well that's a sign that we're in trouble. That's an, a sign that that like we we don't even have debate. We've lost the logos. We've even lost debate. We we've we've just got. Like sort of verbal rugby or something going on. I yeah. don't know. What it, right, 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 right. <laughs> yeah, it is. I think it really is. You know, um, I saw in some of your work you talk about psychedelics and psychedelic use. Yes, you know, yes, yes. and the value of that yes. in, um, yeah. like, uh, getting people to be able to access and help solve issues that are inside of them. Trauma. Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. Yes. Have you had experience with it? I've done psychedelics in my past. Um, I can't like to party or to learn? To learn. So this was a long time ago. Um, I was about three or four years into doing Tai Chi Chuan. I was doing it religiously in both senses of the word. I was doing it like hours every day. I was going to the really? dojo three or four times. I was getting all that, you know, where you're hot like lava and cold like ice and all those woo experiences and everything. Um, and then something happened that sort of twigged me um so some people came to me i was in graduate school and they said uh you've changed what's different about you you're much more balanced and flexible and i realized oh the tai chi is changing me i'm so concentrated on all the wonderful bizarre experience and i'm not paying attention to how my character my cognition my con like how i'm showing up how i'm how I'm you know, comporting myself. To, that was being changed. Other people were noticing that. And, I, and, and, I, and that's, that's been something I've been looking for. I keep looking for. When, so, when somebody recommends a practice, does it transfer broadly, deeply, and effectively into their many domains of their life? Does it percolate between different layers of their psyche? And so it's like, oh, oh, oh. And so, and I had a very good friend and... Uh, I won't out that person, of course, because, of course, these things are still technically illegal. Uh, but that that's going to change soon, too. Um, and uh, they offered to uh, do magic mushrooms. And I said to myself, and this is explicitly how I framed it. And I said, I want to go on magic mushrooms and I want to do Tai Chi Chuan mm. on when I'm, when I'm high because I want to know what it's like what it what's the what what it feels like what the, what the phenomenology is like when because the psychedelics reduce your egocentrism right yeah and, and they and they open up that connectedness you're falling in love with reality I want to know what it's like to do Tai Chi like that because if I do what I can do is I can remember it right and what I can and I can use that like a touchstone and so what I can do is right I can practice. And I'll have this deep felt memory of what it was like. And I can keep calibrating the practice so that I can get into that state without having to use wow. the drug. And so that's how I did it. Uh, and was it helpful? Yes. <laughs> yes. It worked. Yeah, that, that worked as a strategy. Now, that, that brings me to something. Like, so remember the processes that make you adaptive, make you self-deceptive? Real quick. So it works yeah. as a strategy in the sense it helped you get deeper and then in subsequent experiences you was able to still get deeper? Yeah. Because of that. I, I, can, I can get to that state now in Tai Chi Chuan without having to be on mushrooms. Dang, boy, he's saving money. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, well, and other things. Yeah. Uh, and other things. <laughs> um yeah, I mean, I can't. I I couldn't do it now if I wanted to because of m I have Meniere's in my left ear. So Meniere's? Yeah, it's a 
they don't know what causes it, but my inner ear can, and I can't talk about it too long because it can trigger an attack. Uh, my, my, my <laughs> wow, inner, what a freaking crazy disease. Yeah, it's a bad disease. Uh, oh, my, my, yeah. my, my inner ear will suddenly fill with liquid and I'll get the worst vertigo you can possibly imagine. Oh, my buddy gets that if you say his ex-wife's name around him. Yeah, yeah, that I can. I He'll can. fucking start running in a circle. But psychedelics, right? Psychedelics, what they do is we and and we're not we're not I, I, you know and I work with uh, I talked to, I was uh, uh, Alex Benier he's got his new book out the bigger picture I was on when he released it I I talked to people who do psychedelic uh, work um, uh, and you know and I read people like Robin Carhart Harris and others Here, the idea is you when you're dreaming you're basically doing what psychedelics do so the idea is. Your brain is always taking a sample of information from the world mm -hmm. and it's trying to predict what, like we've talked about this, right? Now you face two problems in that. One is you can call, you can do what's called overfitting to the data. You can get all locked into the, pr the patterns that are in the sample, but don't actually aren't in the world. Okay. Right? Right? Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. It's called overfitting to the data. You can also underfit to the data, which is you don't pick up on patterns that are, that are in the sample that are also, that are actually in the world. So you, 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 there's two kinds of errors you can make. The problem you face is that they're in a trade-off relationship. As you try to solve one, you make the other worse. Uh. And so you're constantly caught between them. And so what you do, machine learning, like like deep learning, the, these machines that are- AI and stuff? Yeah, oh yes. Like, yeah, yeah. So- they face this problem, and what they periodically do is they will throw noise into the system. They will shut off half the nodes, or they'll put in static information. And that what that does is it prevents the system from overfitting to the data. It breaks up the frame enough so that the machine will go to a wider framing, like we were talking about earlier. And it wow. looks like that's what you're doing in dreaming. That's what psychedelics do. So psychedelics basically get parts of the brain that normally don't talk to each other to mm -hmm. talk to each other. Oh, yeah. Right? It's like the in-laws dinner or whatever. Something like that, yeah. And so the thing is, you they have to be put in the right context because when you are, when you're sort of unmooring your salience landscape, right, that could possibly lead to insight or you could also rabbit hole and get into your own personal bullshit really, really powerfully. So, you know, back in the 60s, people talked about set and setting. That's still true. You got to have set and setting. But you also have to have, you know, a, 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 a two, two more S's. One of the words is a multi -select. It's sapiential. That means having to do with wisdom. Okay. You, need, you need to set, if, you, if you're going to do psychedelics, you need to make sure you're doing lots of other practices that challenge your proclivity, your proneness to self-deception. That's what I mean by a sapiential context. And then, like how indigenous people, it's need, which they do that, they have the shamans usually, right? And you also have to have it in a sacred context, right? Where there's a context in which your altered states of consciousness are not just r running around free. They have a worldview that can properly home uh, them and integrate them in. Yeah, I went to, I did an ayahuasca ceremony. Right, which, right. man, I didn't, it helped me so much. It was unbelievable. Yes, it can. You know? And I'd had I'd, I'd been sober for a few years, and I got and I'd done a ton of therapy, but I'd never been able to put. I could I couldn't adjust my perspective. Right. I couldn't yeah. adjust you, the yeah, framework yeah. that I was yeah. looking yes, at this exactly. Thing and when it when it helped me to the immense, it did. I feel like it literally did a thousand sessions of therapy in two days. That's what the research shows. The research shows. Unbelievable. That if put in the right context. And that's what we were in. I mean, we were yeah. in yeah. a place, they had a shaman, they had all these little light, uh, like candles and all yeah, these. There's a and this, there was a lot of music that really put you in a special yeah. space. Yeah. Everybody was wearing white gowns and robes yeah. were yeah. in there. There's a lot of symbolism, yes. Yes, yeah. there was a ton of symbolism. So you... There was a lot of like um, traditional like moments that we went through before and throughout yes. the experience. It was like a nine hour experience, and and also like a day. There was this time where we would get up with these maracas or yep. shakas or whatever, yeah, chakras, and we'd have to shake like these little thing with yeah. the sand in them, yeah, yeah, and you'd have to shake them and do this like dance ritual, like 
there was a lot of rituals yes. that made it very, made the whole experience more powerful. And, you, and more transferable. So you you can integrate it, you can transfer it, bleeds to different levels of your psyche, bleeds into different domains of your life, like I was talking right. about. That's exactly it. The problem with that now, too, though, is that's becoming... A business. Well, it's becoming a business. It's becoming commodified, and you know, a, 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 an ayahuasca tourism is. Oh yeah, up. totally. Yeah, like come on down here. You Have know? your experience that you can go back and tell your friends about. Right, yeah, kind of thing. And there's some of the flowers. Even there's like a sexy woman on the flower. Like, what does this have to do with? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Like it's it like, just. But yeah, yeah, it's scary that that's how everything becomes. I, do you think down the road we will look back at society like thousands of years from now and be like, what a poor left turn that society took you think we'll be back in like villages and looking back like what do you think it the long game looks like if well, you the, have any predictions well, i don't know about predictions i know about a possibility my good friend jordan hall talks about a possibility that we haven't had before so until recently in order to get the benefits of civilization we had to live close to each other and then that gives us all the noxious side effects but the the force multiplication of civilization was worth it right but now what we can do is we can we can do all the civilization stuff virtually and then we could live in small scale communities uh he calls this the civium project so we could live in you know groups of 150 people growing our own food we could live in this way that is psychologically physiologically healthy and yet we could still benefit from you know that that massive collective agency, that collective wisdom, the collective intelligence that civilization affords. And we could, and now we, they, we don't have to physically live like with, millions, right. right? We could, and so we now have the possibility where we could turn to, we could live psychologically, physiologically, physically as we evolved to while participating in a hyper-technological civilization with all of the force multiplication that mm. that gives you. And it's, this is a real possibility. And, he, you know, he's done stuff to try and make it happen, but, you know, it's like a, uh, uh, you know, uh, the lone voice crying in the wilderness kind of thing. Until he isn't. Until he isn't. And I hope he keeps coming back to it. Um, that's a real possibility. We could take that turn. It, it, for me, if we could take that turn while building up, uh, uh, you know, the, the, these kinds of ecologies of practices, both individually and collectively, are, are talking about, um, and, w and he and I have talked about how those would integrate and support each other. Um, that could, you know, that could that could be a, a turn away from the, s some of the the darkness that many of us feel we're we're entering into. Yeah. Cool, man. I don't think I have anything else to think about. <laughs> I mean, I could probably think about more, but I don't know if I could do it. You know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's a lot to think, you know? Yeah, yeah. Whenever you get burned out from thinking, what do you like to do? When I get burned out from thinking, um, sometimes I like to do embodied stuff, like Tai Chi Chuan or meditate. Sometimes I like to read some very good literature uh, where I'm putting myself sort of into somebody else's uh, thinking. Do you read fiction ever? Yeah, I'm reading... Uh, uh, I'm reading The Last of the Wine, which is a really wonderful historical fiction about uh, Athens in the Peloponnesian War. And we're following these two characters as they form a profound uh, platonic relationship. But platonic actually means also sexual at that time. So, oh, yeah. Uh, right, but, but, um, I do it. But, but they're encountering, like, they're, they're, like they, meet, they meet Socrates is there. Oh, wow. And so for me, it's like I get to meet Socrates and I like, can hang around with him. Plato, I just, I was read to a chapter and I, I sort of stopped and I savored the moment and I read it again. And, you know, they're in, they're in, they, they go to the gymnasium and Aristocles is there and he's a wrestler. And that's actually Plato's real name. He's Aristocles. Plato, Plato means broad shoulders because he was a wrestler. Mm. That was his nickname. And I said to myself, I just met Plato. That's yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, the Delphi, that was like your WWF, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it, it was, uh, I, 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 I used to be a big fan of like science fiction. And occasionally there's some good science fiction. But now, um, like maybe it's just because I'm older, um, I'm finding... A histor really good historical fiction to be uh, a, a friend of mine, m m one of my most important friends, Christopher Pietro, my co-author on so much work. Uh, he he's works uh, for the Raviki Foundation. Uh, he's also recommended. Mem uh, what is it? 
uh, Hadrian's Memoirs, I believe it's called. I've got that book. Uh, it's about Hadrian writing to the young Marcus Aurelius, trying to uh, educate him in how to be a, a great Stoic uh, uh, emperor. Um, and so I find that kind of literature, when it's not hackneyed, when it's really well-researched and well-written, I find that very inspiring. It helps me to asp uh, aspire to be the, the kind of person I want to be. And I find that um, it, it, I find because it's inspiring and it's beautiful, I find it very uh, healing and restorative. Mm. I was just reading um, this book. I think it's called The Library. You look it up by this guy, Matt Haig, H-A-I-G. And it's about this lady. She thinks her life is like horrible, right? So she wants to take her own life. But the second she does, she like wakes up in a library and every book on the shelf is um, the Midnight Library. That's what it's called. And every book on the shelf is a different possibility of her life if she had oh, made different choices. Oh. And there's a billion books. It's an endless library. Of course. So she can take one and open it and she'll be in that life. And it's really interesting because it's like it, 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 the author just kind of takes you on the journey where no Every life you think, oh, if I had just stayed and done this thing, but there's a million other things That's that are right. different about that life. That's right. That you didn't realize, oh, when I get to this life, like my father had passed away early or um, my partner had left me yep. or I was yep. cheating on. Yep. Yep. There's just, uh, it's just pretty fascinating to see all the different, like the broader view instead of just being like very specific, like, oh, if this one thing yeah. changes, I, I would be awesome. But if that one thing changed, then so many things would change. That That's excellent. I think I, I think I would like to read that book it's that really book. cool it's yeah. easy to read it blew my mind how just what a creative idea it was but it's a really good idea that's what um, good literature can do right it yeah can, it can it can it can persuade you like it without making an argument but nevertheless it, it, it rationally persuades you to really consider and reflect on things yeah, yeah it kind of made me excited it was like i hadn't read something that had like kind of a new idea or something that i had never thought of or heard seen before you know and I was like, oh, this is exciting. It felt promising, you know? New ideas that have both truth and relevance. See, like you said, they're so nourishing. Yeah. Right? They feed your mind in a way that inf information, you know, doesn't. Uh, yeah. I, I well, we're at a place now where everyone has access to the same information. So the, the value of information itself has kind of diminished unless you can iterate that information or share that information to people uh, concisely and effectively and in ways that they can digest it. I think that's one of the reasons why people are going uh, to a lot of like orders and speakers and Stoics yep. and yeah, yeah. Um, yes. different like uh, just different, I don't know what they'd be called, but evangelists maybe, but that's, but non-Christian, non, yeah, 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 yeah. non-religious evangelists, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. because they, they, they need, you know, I don't know what I'm saying. I know. I think what you're saying is like people have a sense of the, the you know uh, uh, of something that will open them up in that way you were talking about. Yeah, and, and they see that possibility and they're hungry for it. Yeah, yeah, they're hungry for it. And some of the old mediums of it have um, proven to be non-valuable. Right. Recently, and so I think they're looking for new mediums of it. So, yeah, T.S. Eliot said, where's all the wisdom we've lost in knowledge? Where's all the knowledge we've lost in the information? Mm. And, and so, yeah, it's, it's like that very much. And, and, and good literature can take you back. Like, it take you from the information into the knowledge, and if it's really great literature, from the knowledge back into the wisdom. John Verveke, thanks so much, man. Uh, thank you, Theo. This, this, I really enjoyed this. I, I mean... Um, you 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 drew a lot out from me, and it was really wonderful. You shared a lot, which was really wonderful. And uh, I feel like my, one of my criteria of genuine dialogos is we both got to a place we couldn't have got to on our own. It wasn't just a dialogue. We like there was something a life took shape between us and and, and grew for a while, and we, we sort of followed it. And I really the aesthetics and and the and the meaning of that. I find that very very powerful. Thanks, man. Yeah, I think I was afraid. Sometimes I get afraid to talk to people that are, are uh, have a lot of education, you know, and and are good at sharing information. So I felt, uh, you know, I feel, I guess, pretty happy about myself that, uh, you know, I planned ahead, and so I had somewhat of a plan. So that was nice, uh, but I didn't feel like I had to like stick to it too much, and I felt like I was able to like you know, communicate and learn yeah. and ask questions that I think myself and my listeners are curious about, you know, and be um, 
just like a voice for our little group of uh of listeners so yeah man thanks so much dude and um yeah i gotta come check you out i want to come see a a, a a class or something when i get up there to toronto you're welcome let me know yeah can people come sit in there like they ride along with a cop uh <laughs> you it, there's uh you can you can audit it because the universities are publicly funded in canada um you can audit any course you want as long as it does as long as you get permission of the instructor and it doesn't violate the fire code sometimes i'm in a room and we have there's it's seating for 35 and there's 35 people oh so, yeah right. oh I won't, and i won't wear nothing flammable either i won't wear <laughs> you think i'm gonna wear wool or something i probably won't so but thank you for letting me know john verveke thank you so much for your time thank you so much now i'm just floating on the breeze and i feel i'm falling like these leaves i must be cornerstone oh but when i reach that ground i'll share this peace of mind i found i can feel it in my bones but it's gonna take